Have you got my camera and everything? Yeah. Hello, everyone. We are live. Uh, I have with me Golden Sound. We're just waiting on uh, Graph Guy uh, to join us here in a little bit. He has computer woes, and so he is currently troubleshooting that. Uh, but uh, we are. The time is now for us to go live, so we've gone live. Um, <clears throat> while we're waiting on Graph Guy, um, as usual, let us know how the audio levels are. We, uh, you guys, are the producers of this show. There's nobody else behind the scenes. It's all you guys. So let us know if the audio is good. I've just recently, I was telling Cameron here that I've just recently swapped over to a completely new motherboard and CPU setup. So I have no idea if anything works. Um, so yeah, this is uh, this is a uh, trial by the by the audience, I suppose. <laughs> trial by fire. Uh, so what we're gonna do today is we are going to have a cheeky little live stream to discuss various different topics in audio uh, that we have deemed interesting for today, given the personnel we have, uh, and also following on the heels of uh, some of the videos that have come out recently. Then we will go into Spicy Hour, where we will have all the spicy discussion, uh, and uh, then we will uh, we will sign off. That's that's basically the t the agenda for today. Uh, We're talking but it, about the benefits of purple fuses. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I I may as well just uh, dive into some of the topics here and just mention them, and we can get into them properly once once Blaine joins us. Uh, but the topics I have uh, for us today is topic number one: Do amps and decks really matter? Um, we've talked about this in the past. I'm not sure if we actually used exactly this as the title, but um, you know, you got to be you got to be spicy. You got to you got to go if you're going fishing. You need a hook, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to what degree should people care about them? Uh, so that's the first topic. Uh, the second topic is what do each of us consider a to be a great DAC and a great amp? Uh, and then the third one I have e here is snake oil. So what do we consider to be snake oil? Audio nonsense or audio foolery, the impact of placebo and confirmation bias. And I feel four, like we're going to have quite a spicy, spicy Oh, element. yeah, yeah. And number four, are discussions of or judgments regarding technicalities more helpful or more harmful in the audio discourse? And uh, are there ways in which wrong takes can lead to new information? Uh, so those are the topics for today. Uh, but in the meantime, again, we are just uh, waiting on Blaine, so I'm just filling dead air. This is... Uh, <laughs> I, I suppose not dead air because we have Cameron here. <laughs> we got so, any spicy uh, questions we can answer? Yeah, we'll go, we, we can do some spicy stuff uh, to begin with while I share the uh, the stream. And I should also mention that, uh, of course, uh, all of this is made possible by Headphones.com. All of the content that we do on our channel is made possible by Headphones.com. So big shout outs to Headphones.com. Um, we also now have merch. I am wearing one of the shirts that can be purchased. This is a, it's the Tangle Tee. It's just a whole bunch of headphones and audio stuff. There's also an interesting mug. And weirdly... Oh, I actually want to get one of those. Okay, did you get the desk mat? Because I just got no. the desk... Okay, the desk mat is... I was thinking, okay, it's just like a branded desk mat with like the head, our you know logo and branding on it. And I was just going to use it mainly for B-roll. And then I got it in and was like, oh my god, this is an extremely high quality desk mat. <laughs> like I have... I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to, the, to that stuff. Like I use the artisan mouse pads. Um... And then I swapped over to that one just briefly, thinking I wouldn't actually be using it. And it's actually really, really good. Like, it's way better than the Corsair one that I had as my previous desk mat. Like, the, that was terrible <laughs> in comparison. So uh, I'm using a, a desk called the Arozzi Arena, which, like, the whole thing, yeah. like, the shape, contour, and okay. this, yeah. uh, mat, mouse mat. Not actually because I use my mouse on the whole thing, but just because you can just, like, plonk headphones down, not scratch them. It's just it's, nice. Yeah, it's nice for that. And of course, if you do want to, you know, play FPS games on ultra low sensitivity, <laughs> just yeah, use the entire surface of the desk. Um, yeah, no, for me, it's all just for like RTS purposes, right? Like I'm, I play uh, RTS, and uh, so for me, like I'm very picky about the mouse pad that I use. So um, that's fair. I was yeah pleasantly surprised with uh, with the uh, the desk mat that we have. Um, Ace of I Spades is noted a topic which I'm gonna write down for sure. us to discuss later which is class a versus other stuff because i know blaine actually particularly wanted to talk let's... about what is not class a yeah let's uh, let's i'll put that in as a subtopic here class a versus not <laughs> yeah all right class um... a and <laughs> class a and 
um how how have you been how was your i haven't spoken to you uh well lo- other than in a call uh since uh can jam yeah and- uh not too bad i my eustachian tubes are on strike at the moment which is a little bit annoying but other than that i'm doing okay and for those who don't uh who aren't aware of what that is maybe <laughs> oh <laughs> uh, it's the tube that connects your like uh inner ear to the respiratory system and stuff for pressure imbalances that's just a bit blocked up at the moment so i've got about 30 percent more slam in one ear than the other and i can hear myself talking really loud in my left ear clearing up but got a few days to go i had the worst of that uh in when i was recently in thailand and i'd gotten covid uh in, it, yeah in thailand and like i wasn't i didn't go like i was in thailand and i had covid and i got i recovered basically but post covid I still had like some messed up, you know, eustachian, eustachiosity. <laughs> I'm making up words now, uh, as a true audiophile would. Um, and uh, but then, and it was it was like I didn't have the you know the the blocked ear issue, but then I went on a flight, and it was so bad for days. Like I just couldn't hear anything out of that one ear for days. Um, yeah that's exactly what happened to me I, so. it was fine there and then i got on the plane and because i was like a bit stuffy and stuff and then on the plane i got yeah. off got off and my ear just never quite cleared itself up yeah i had the exact same thing a couple years ago and it took like two weeks to clear up fully so it, it it's going it's just annoying when it happened i had i, I had luck with the antihistamine uh, so it helped clear that up mm, i should try that yeah uh penguins 10 these are the austrian audio composer so sort of AKG, but not really. How how do you like those? Do you change? We can't hear you, Graph Guy. Uh, do you change the like position of the like what you know? You can lift up the nubbin to change the angle. Where are you like? I've got them like on the first notch. They are just a little bit angled. Um, I'm gonna have a review of them on my own channel. They I like them, but mostly once you EQ them just with a slight tilt. Little bit of bass, little bit lower treble, and then mm-hmm. I really like them. Without the EQ, they're they're a bit bright, but um, once you do that, I I, I like them a lot. Okay. Yeah, uh, we still can't hear you. It's nice though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you can hear me now, right? Yes. Yes. Blaine has joined us in, with all the glory of the hat and um, the best headphones in the world. For um, Class 3 listeners. For Class 3 listeners. We, somebody needs to have a fight with Sean about that, and it can't be me because I've been fighting with Sean too much lately, but they are not actually diffuse field compensated. They're not. Uh, if anything, the HD600 is more diffuse field. Yeah, it has more upper mids. Yeah, exactly. And the th- the so like the cornerstone of Teal's argument about tone, color, and timbre the HD 800 does not apply to that, right? Like the, uh, the 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 key feature, I would say, right? Ironically, the HD 800 is much closer to a speaker with rising directivity as a function of frequency in a real reverberant room. Okay. <laughs> well, it is. It's just that it has the treble peak. Right. But I barely hear that. Hearing damage? Maybe. Do you think you... Conceivably. I mean, have you have you tested your hearing in the past? Yeah, I mean the thing is I haven't done a full threshold of hearing audiogram. Right. But so you're... while I know that the upper limit of my hearing is quite normal for my age, it's like as far 16. as we're aware, you're not over fifty and you're not female, which was the two criteria that he put in the slide. So well, but I am all, I am untrained, as evidenced by my uh, right, yes. eight hundred. <laughs> but that's not technically true. Like, would you place yourself in the like? I. There's untrained and then well, there's I mean, like... it's self-demonstrating, isn't it? I like the uh, HD 800. Yeah, there yeah, but, but then you're also female and or over 50 and or... Like... I'm over 55 in spirit. <laughs> okay. Apparently like... it was also specifically Germans and I am somewhat Germanic in my origins. So, or they know, could tell it was... It, they, they could tell basically what the, uh, the, uh, the, the preferred headphone brand would, would sound like. <laughs> so, so they selected for it. Um, I see someone complaining about the composer. Oh, it's Joel. Yeah. I like how they were built. 
More headphones should be They're built. They're built like, brilliantly, except for the cable. The cable sucks, but the headphones themselves I mean, are built cables suck. excellent. The one most thing, of them do. There are a couple with good cables, but most of them. The ones, suck. <clears throat> like the ones we sell. I didn't like about the composer that I didn't like. I touched on it briefly, but I didn't focus on it in the review. Is just how sensitive they are to positional variation. It's it's extreme yeah. with those ones, and they're not the only ones I, like this. But like, yeah, it's really noticeable. I thought they, I were thought okay. they had a channel imbalance, but it's not. <laughs> it's just because the way that this cup sits on my jaw slightly differently yeah. than this one, I mean that I actually have to position them really carefully, or else I have a channel imbalance. They, the drivers themselves don't, but the yeah, the positional uh, variation is yeah. steep. Three bears talking about headphones. Bears. Is What's Cameron that? a bear? I don't. I don't know. Wait, I don't think he's hairy enough to be a bear. Wait, what is what are we talking about here? Is this someone said that in the chat? Yes, but <laughs> okay, never mind. I'm not sure what this is in reference to. If this is in reference to bears or Goldilocks or something else. <laughs> well, no, it's it's presumably in reference to the gay subculture bears. Okay, okay. Given that we're all rather fuzzy, well, two of us are rather fuzzy. I'm not sure why Cameron's getting lumped in with that. <laughs> yeah. This stream is already off the rails. <laughs> but all okay. right. Well, I mean, listen, it was off the rails because I was late. Sorry about that. Computer issues, and as you can see, I'm sitting next to the sun, so I'm probably going to need to go off shot for a second to slightly adjust that. It looks good though. Yeah, I've got some. Oh, sun. you like it? Which should clear well, up in the next hour or so. It's but. not as nice as it will be when we get you set up with the proper camera there. But Do you mean the one that keeps overheating? Are you using it correctly? I, wasn't that the one that you had to stop using because it kept overheating? Maybe. <laughs> like, yeah, but I, I remember was when it was using a feature correctly. of our streams that yeah. every, every <laughs> hour or so your camera would overheat. No, that was a Fuji X-T4, I think. Uh, and this yeah, is yeah. not that. This no, is this another is camera. Yeah, I'm camera. very informed of the cinema file, or well, no, wait, what is what is the word for photo fetishists? Nerd. <laughs> Shutterbug. That is that is the phrase. I am very up on the Shutterbug happenings of the kids. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, we'll so. get that going. Anyways, this has been a great start to the stream. Uh, how how is everybody? I mean, I was just chatting with Cameron, but uh, how are you, Blaine? Uh, I'm all right. I'm somehow still like slightly sick from Can Jam, but it's gone from like I feel like absolute living death to like I have a stuffy nose, which is nice. <laughs> it's like that. I may be. <laughs> An inevitability that if you go to Can Jam, you will get sick. I got less sick than everyone else, though. It seems like everyone else got, like, horrible sick. I, I was okay afterwards as well. Because um, I I just didn't sleep. Well, you were the, probably the one who brought the plague. Uh, no, I wasn't sick by the time I got, like, when I got there. I was, I was fine, like, when I got there. It's just I didn't sleep the entire weekend, basically. <laughs> so. Yeah, that's uh, not good for you. No, it's not. But I didn't get sick afterwards, surprisingly. But everybody else did. Um, like DMS got real sick. Yeah. I mean, yeah, DMS, DMS got is worse always than I did. DMS is always real sick. Yeah, it's just his natural condition. <laughs> I mean, it is. I mean, it's yours too. Like to be real, <laughs> like. Yeah, but it's like much less severe. I'm always like annoying sick. Mm, okay. I mean, actually, no, what I have is that I always have really bad allergies, and I can't tell it apart from being mildly sick. Right, right. Anyway. Anyways, so... Uh, Do asked. amps make you sick? <laughs> Find out on the headphone show. I would right. argue... All right, sorry, are we, are we starting? Yeah, so topic <laughs> number one. Do amps and DAX really matter? Uh, and to what degree should people care about them? And then as a sub question of that, class A versus not. So maybe we can tackle the first part. First. Okay, so th that's like, that's three questions. You've yeah. just given us three questions that you use commas to disguise as one question. Whatever, you can deal with it. Okay. All right. Should, let's let's go. Let, let's go. Camera? Okay, let's go with. So here's let's 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 provide the context. So, um, the, Cameron, you recently put out a video on the shit audio Midgard. Which yep. uh, for those who, take off the hat 
for those who haven't seen the Midgard video, check yeah. that out. Lots of measurements in there. Uh, uh, back on. Okay. And you quite liked the Midgard, though, right? Yes. And, and I did not like the previous one. The yeah. Previous. And yet both of them would measure in a way where we would sort of describe them as being similarly fine, right? Objectively. Um, and one thing you actually did in the in the Midgard video that I thought was interesting was you gave a an indication of what might be responsible for your experience, for why you mm. ended up liking it. And maybe we can dig into that. But I suppose the bigger question uh, to get into first is uh, how do we square a situation like this where you have two products that measure similarly good, one of them is preferred and one of them is not? Um, what do we think about that situation, basically? I think, I mean, the first thing that I just want to say in terms of my belief i guess is that if something is audibly different you can measure it if two things are absolutely identical in every single way they sound the same there is no reason as to why something will sound different but you won't be able to demonstrate any difference other than if it is a purely psychological effect every device that i've tested that has sounded different to something else has had something about it that was clearly measurably different and the magnus and the midgard are no different there um the distortion profile is a bit different, even though it's still very low. Uh, the biggest thing I think I mentioned in the video was that at high frequencies, it distorts more, whereas the Magnus, I believe, was pretty much completely flat. Um, so the first thing to clear up is that a lot of people will look at just a synad measurement or something and say, oh, these two things measure the same. But having the same or similar synad does not mean measuring the same. And there are a lot of situations where something can have excellent synad or very similar synad, but then in other ways behave, in some cases, quite drastically different. In fact, should I do a practical example? Yes. Let's do that. And so, yeah. Let me uh, sort this out. He's going to fade away into the blur. He's going to pull the headphones off of his head with walking away from them. <laughs> I'm actually amazed by how well Discord's shitty auto blur is following his body. We're getting like a very good shot of Cameron's rump. It's because it's um, the fight. NVIDIA broadcast one, not the shitty Discord one. <laughs> ah, there it is. Rumpfy. <laughs> also, the real power move of wearing shorts because you're not expecting your legs to be visible, but then standing up. I mean, it's better than not wearing pants. <laughs> or anything. Who would show up to a stream not wearing <laughs> pants? Oh, I've done that, for sure. I've done videos what? not wearing pants. What? You can't tell. You don't know. <laughs> but like half of the videos you shot were in the office. Well, not those Were ones. you wearing pants yeah, for was, those? <laughs> obviously, I was wearing pants for those. <laughs> well, you say obviously. I wouldn't think to take off my pants regardless <laughs> if I was on camera. <laughs> uh, okay, right. You should see that now. Okay, so... Sometimes I just I like... I, I prefer the sort of free air, you know. Chat says uh, pants check. <laughs> no, you're not getting it. <laughs> <laughs> Are you not wearing pants? You'll never know. God. I prefer the ambiguity. All right, what's okay, going on? Okay, so can you see that? Will that go on stream without problems? Uh, it, Andrew, Andrew has a bad workflow. Can't, but I think it's working. Oh, except I got to well, get rid of this. Hold on a second. Yeah, you have to click the button and then you have to move your little your All face, right. your little face. I got it. You're, you're just seeing the stream delayed here. Mad right, so I'm sure we might come back to this again in a what? bit, but just as a very brief example, so if I were to play a one kilohertz sign, uh, let me set this back up one second. Right, so if I play a one kilohertz sign through this, and you can see that we've got a sign out of 97 and the second harmonic's at about minus 100. So that would indicate that it's pretty good. But then as soon as you go to, let's say, 15 kilohertz. Uh, oh, no, no, so, you know, let's not do that. Let's do like 6 or 7 so you can actually see the harmonics. Not 6 hertz, Jesus Christ. There we go. Now yep. we're down to about 52 and minus sure. 50. And based on what it was showing for numbers at, at uh, 16, I'm guessing that it degrades from there. Yeah. Yeah, so th this is just a quick example of what I was um, describing in the Midgard video. I mean, obviously this one does it more drastically. But yeah, basically, 
just because something performs in a particular way at one kilohertz, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to do so at all frequencies or in all situations. Yeah, so, uh, you're, so you're you're plotting uh, distortion versus frequency with in yeah. the in the later section of that um, video. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I suppose the to me at least, and Blaine, let me know if this is a terrible uh, well. supposition. Probably is, but to me, the crux of the question is more to do with situations where you have two devices where their uh whatever products are contributing distortion or noise um are similar they might be different from one another in terms of the profile or the what the products are but they'd both be similarly below the audible threshold with music and and and, 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 that, and that's sort of the the key question yeah. is where that threshold lies right yeah. like yeah with speakers, and of course, that's specific to the order of distortions, and that's specific to the stimulus. You, you select music there because, and I've made this argument before, and I'm still mad that I can't put the voice coil melting sample on our audio on our site. But uh, why not? You were the one who said I can't make an audio clip that will melt people's headphones. Oh yeah, no, we don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah that's seems lame. like a risky plan. <laughs> well, but, but like the thing is, you know, mm -hmm. if you have. If you're doing an intermodulation thing and you have, you know, either, well, in that case, it'd be second or third order meaningful distortions, and you play two ultrasonic tones, you can crank those things as high as you want, and then you'll hear a distortion product. You could hear minus 120 distortion products that way if you're willing to play it loud enough ultrasonic. I wish you could play live streams at double speed. Don't worry, we'll just talk faster. Uh, but the problem is with music, we have a much more complex stimulus, and it's a stimulus that has content generally pretty much everywhere right and that in turn makes all the spuria a lot harder to hear so because of the masking effect right where it becomes inaudible we have some evidence right like we have things like fielder's work where we have masking thresholds as a function of frequency and level we have tests where people have generally shown that with low order distortions they have trouble hearing even you know 0.5 percent in music in many cases but we don't uh what we don't necessarily have is the ability to pin down like an exact number like is there a transparent tube amp where transparency is all below the threshold of audibility i would say it's definitely possible to design well i mean if you look at the uh he1 it's those have well i mean that, that's tubes, not but they do nothing <laughs> well i mean it is a tube well all right, yeah so what i meant is a pure tube amp gotcha not a tube preamp like a tube preamp is a lot easier but anyway, like the question is, where is that tip over point? So if you say the tip over point, is it nonlinearities at the levels that you're playing music are below 100 dB below the signal? I would be shocked if anyone would contend that that was audibly differentiable. Like, now I'd be interested if Cameron has an example of two amplifiers that are that linear that he's How, perceived. Wait, what was the between. number you said, sorry? 100 dB below. Uh, well, so, okay. One of the interesting things, and to be completely clear, I do not know why this is different, but the Synxor SA-1 and the Shit Magnius, I think that those were the two that I originally uh, was having the debate on ASR about doing the blind test with uh, before that went to hell. Um, and so you perceive a difference between those? Yes. I was able to AVX with them, and I don't know why, because those, like, it's I can't find anything on them which is clearly they're different but it's all so low level that it doesn't really make sense to me that any of the individual aspects should be uh, audible there's like there's obviously a very different design philosophy with them and one thing which i i hope i'm all right to say this i think i think it's something which is actually quite an important data point um which is that i've said in videos a few times that the sort of really feedback dependent products so the stuff which is using you know op amps nested in the feedback loops of other op amps and stuff and the whole design is based around that to me don't sound as good subjectively even versus other stuff which measures excellently a sinks or sa1 or a hollow bliss or whatever um and interestingly the product return rates for those products are drastically higher than others as well and that's well, interesting because that's something us. which for us. yes yes for us but the fact that they are so vastly higher is 
uh, again, there's you know a very wide crowd of people buying them. I I feel is it doesn't give an answer as to why it might be, but it is quite an interesting data point that supports a hypothesis that they do sound different. Well, I, I just want to push back on that a little bit. It's not always clear what the reason is for people no. returning stuff. Uh, both functionally, like maybe there's a, a particular uh, type of function that's missing from the thing that you know, that caused them to return it that they wanted, right? Um, but the other is, you know, we don't know, like people are buying these things based on confirmation bias, both in the measurements case, but also in the, you know, reviewer says X about the product. Therefore, I'm going to pay attention more to X uh, or try and, you know, it's it's going to influence their uh judgment about it right and their experience about it to a certain extent and if you have a whole bunch of people saying uh discrete is better op amp based designs are are worse um you know this is going to have an impact on some i expect at least it's going to have an impact on some of those return rates oh uh, there's, there's, there's a will. philosophical quibble here as well discrete and op amp based are not mutually exclusive mm, what you no. mean is discrete and ic op amp yes. based yes yes the GNU yeah, plus I mean, Linux of the audio discussion. <laughs> I mean, because that's the thing. I don't like. I don't hate op amps or anything. There are various products which are op amp based, which I really like. Be it this, like the or oh, the Ferramore is a discrete op amp. The there are some stuff with IC op amps which I really like as well. Um, it it seems to be the stuff. The correlation, and again, it's just in my Cameron, experience is, is your audio you're basically good? talking about the nested feedback composite uh, Sorry, current is, whatever is it is Amps, Cameron's right? audio clipping for anybody slightly oh, it's uh, getting weird staticky stuff every once in a while one sec oh okay so says... go ahead the thing about the topping ones and I think this is an interesting one i wouldn't say I'm close to John Yang, but I do know him. Um, and I find him an interesting guy, and I think he has some, I think he's a very good designer from an optimization standpoint. Something that I've always sort of had an issue with for the topping stuff is that they are not the most stable topology inherently. When you have a high gain IC that is in that has its own local feedback loop inside the feedback loop of an IC with a different with particularly a, a different IC which has a different phase margin you end up with a more complicated system to stabilize. And we do know objectively that some toppings have been unstable. Right? Well, we like saw we that with the L30, right? Yeah. Oh, also, is my audio fixed? Uh, seems okay now. Cool. So something that I'm always cautious of when people use that as an example is I would really want to monitor them in situ with something with enough bandwidth to observe whether they were, frankly, oscillating. Like... That is the case. Actually, this is this is very old. If we get back to the Northwest AV guy blog, a classic, by the way, not written by me. Um, <laughs> despite what some have alleged. <laughs> despite what some have alleged, not written by me. Um, one of the examples he gave of why you need a real audio analyzer, and I think that people kind of latched onto that argument without understanding the why, was that he had a friend who had built an amplifier. I think it was an AMB Mini or something. Um, but he'd messed up the wiring and the cable capacitance was sufficient to cause it to oscillate. And it was very audible. And notably, it was audibly different with different cables because the actual oscillation was changed by the cable load because it was so unstable. Um, which is, you know, that's something that happens, right? Like, that's a real phenomenon, but that's a phenomenon of a device behaving badly as opposed yeah. to these two devices that measure the same or that measure equally inaudibly bad are audibly differentiable. And I do wonder about that whenever less stable designs are invoked. Um, like there's a reason that if you look at the designs that arguably the topping stuff was based on, which was, um, going back things like the, and, and I know, well, John may not like this characterization. If you look at designs that are older and that have similarities, like, for example, the design of the original headphone amps from Benchmark, they used a fixed gain buffer for their output stages in the feedback loop, and they very specifically designed it with an eye towards stability. And I do worry that in the case of specifically topping, that... Uh, 
<laughs> I, I do worry in the case specifically topping that we get into a this might actually be misbehaving. Right. With the Sphinxer, I'm not sure. Um, and which one was that you're comparing to the Sphinxer? The Magnius? Uh, Magnius, yeah. And that's the discrete one, not the heresy. That's no, the that's the that's the op-amp based one. I I see op-amps. Right. Wait, it is. Magnius was, yeah. They've replaced it with Midgard, which is discrete. God, I cannot keep track of shit's naming scheme. I thought all of the ones that were based on IC op amps were called Hera something. Uh, the most of the time, the Magnius, they didn't do that. I... I mean, what kind of stuff, like, would you want to sort of look at to try and evaluate that further? Because, I mean, one thing that I'm saving up for at the moment is a much wider bandwidth oscilloscope. Because, like, the AP is great, but it only goes up to one megahertz. I've got a 100 megahertz scope as well, but it's not a particularly great one. But um, Well, I mean, the thing is, if you have a scope, you know, even an 8-bit scope that's 100 megahertz, you will be able to see oscillation. Uh, and you might need to, depending on if your scope, I mean, like, your scope has an FFT mode, right? Uh, not sure. I literally only got this one recently. So I oh, need fair to enough. Well, it if it's a modern any... DSO, it should. Uh, and you will be able to see, you know, megahertz band stuff there. And you'll be able to just, like, I was going to say, if it doesn't, then you might need to actually make a low pass or a high pass filter for it or something. But it, so, like, that's really archaic stuff. I'm sure that you have an FFT. So, but yeah, I, I would want to ensure that the device was full. Um, and in particular with, well, and then this is something that I've been looking at with the AB thing, because like we have sort of weird situations where I have never heard a difference between two amplifiers, right? Like I've level matched them as best I can, gone back and forth, well, but is that true? It is. Like with any, like any at all? Correct. Well, okay. well, hold on, hold on. That, like, do you mean now or do you mean like originally, like at some point? Are you, were you is there ever, something in specific you about? Well, well, no, like like when you were first, like, I guess my question is, were you ever persuaded by any of the confirmation bias stuff? Or no. Did you, okay. No, not really. I mean, like, I hung out with a lot of people who were. Someone sent me, uh, now I know, to be quite distorting Chinese amplifier that he was thought was the, you know, the bee's knees. And I was like, do I hear a difference? I do not believe I do. Right. Um, and then that one probably had like at least minus 60 dB distortion products. It was an audio GD. I was going to so say was, oh, like okay. an, NFV, NFV 11 or something or one of those. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, but there, I am not necessarily the world's most precise listener and confirmation. Have you ever done the <laughs> clip L distortion test just out of curiosity? I mean, not. Yeah, I think I scored or... very average. Oh, okay. I know that you have like a like you got a quite good result on Clipple's distortion audibility, right? Uh, yeah. Which it, it should be noted, the distortion products in that are it's BLX, right? Usually, I cannot remember actually. But, but like they produce fairly high order products, so it is different yeah. from a lot of amplifiers because it's about speakers. Yeah, I, I was able to get down to minus seventy five, but that's as far as the test goes. So, which is very impressive. Um. So anyway. Something that I've been worried about when it comes to these things is basically sort of the, the trinity of one, how well are the levels matched? Because very small level differences are differentiable. In fact, if you look at the lit, it's not even entirely clear of where the floor is. Like I see people talking about matching to plus minus 0. 0.5 dB. And I can tell you that objectively that's 0. 0.5 not good is enough. no, no, that's definitely not good enough. Well, I, uh, whenever I'm doing no. NABX, I got a 0. 0.001. Just yeah, because 0.5, and, you can tell instantly. And uh, the kicker on that is when you get to that low of a level, you also have to look at loading, right? Mm -hmm. Because even a small difference in Z out yep. at that level of difference is differentiable, right? So if you have a one ohm source impedance, and I know that's fairly high, but if you do, and you have, you know, like a 30 ohm headphone, you're still dropping what, like, Shit, is that like 0.25? It's not yeah. a lot, but it is actually. I mean, it won't be an issue have... with DAX, but with amps, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's something where I really think, and one of the things that I really want in ABX is is basically continuous monitoring of both sides, like of both the loaded and unloaded channels. 
because of that fact. Because with speakers, we usually have very, very high damping factors in our amps, but not always. And with headphones, our amplifier output impedance is actually not very well specified. Like, particularly, it may be specified well at 1 kilohertz, but it's actually not even that common to see specified Z out versus frequency. And again, when we're getting into these weeds of minutia, it matters. Like, if you have an output coupling capacitor, your Z out rises at low frequencies. Yep. But that's something which I want to be including in measurements again, but Audio Precision has still not updated the utility for the latest software after like a month. Even that's... though I paid them a grand just to get the newest software so that it actually works on current Windows. So, gotta love that... the Trilogy wow. software prices. <laughs> Very typical, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, so just I, I, if I may, somebody in the chat. I had one more thing on my Trinity oh. of along with, is the level matching good enough? Uh, is you know is it stable? Right. So is the amplifier actually behaving with the headphone load as it's supposed to behave? Is it behaved with your analyzer connected? And how much DC is there? Because now DC should not affect the amplifier's performance, right? Uh, in this case, DC is direct current. It's so audio is a wiggly waveform. Direct current is just it's outputting X amount of voltage that's constant. It could be positive, it could be negative. The thing about that is it doesn't affect the amplifier's performance. That's just an inherent trait of all amplifiers. They have some offsets. However, it can affect the behavior of headphones because it moves where the coil rests. So even if you have an indifferentiable, like you can't hear the transient of the of it swapping, perhaps because it's you know your swap is slow enough or whatever, um, you can still get into a situation where there is a potential audible distortion, not from the amplifier as such, but rather from the headphones because the amplifier has meaningful DC differences. Or conversely, yeah. where you get a cue on which amplifier it is based on the pop or lack thereof of the DC, and obviously. A loud pop, you would know that, right? Like you didn't. The but the only amps we... I've seen, uh, mo mo just in my experience, most modern amps seem to have DC offset in the microvolt range, if not lower. Um, microvolt. Yes. Sometimes. Well, it depends. Um, the only ones I've seen with like meaningful, like, you know, multiple millivolts or higher a DC offset have been uh, bursts and stuff. Other than that, I've not seen many of them with any kind of meaningful offset. It's something which is included on, in my full reports for all the stuff I've tested, yeah. so we can have a look. But Yeah, no, microvolts is actually quite good. I mean, I guess that to some degree reflects that you're mostly measuring stuff with output servos, right? I mean, you can... Uh, uh, well, yeah, mo uh, most uh, amps can have it nowadays, I guess, but... Well, because, like, from a... Like, the average op amp, for example, with a normal bias, like, input bias current you're probably looking at a millivolt of offset. So to get below that, you're realistically looking at either having specifically designed your inputs. Anyway, this is getting to, well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's probably a little, yeah. so, Someone in chat has asked, what is an op amp? And maybe we can... Uh, <laughs> okay, so this gets us into... Like a, a simple explanation. <laughs> okay, an op amp is an amplifier that can perform logical operations. It can do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay, but let's let's in the context of this, you have the op amp based designs, and then you often have discrete designs. Maybe Cameron, if you want to give a quick uh, Cliff Notes version of this, <clears throat> uh, Blaine's probably better suited to do it than I am, to be honest. Okay. In the meantime, you're still crackling okay. for some reason, Cameron. <laughs> oh Christ! Okay. It could be the cable, like a so, connection issue. I don't know. It's so still people keep saying op amp versus discrete. What people mean when they say that is. There are amplifiers that are integrated circuits, right? Where it's all on a single silicon die. Some of those amplifiers, the majority are what we call operational amplifiers, which are amplifiers that have a positive and a negative or an inverting and non-inverting input terminal. That's the characteristic basically of an op amp. When people say something is op amp based, what they usually mean is it's an integrated circuit op amp, which is a single chip that is put in and does the amplifying. With a discrete design, you have a bunch of individual transistors, which are each separate parts on the board, which together make an amplifier. That amplifier can still be an op amp, right? Like, I've designed discrete operational amplifiers. In a lot of cases, it makes a very good sense to design a discrete amp as an operational amplifier. But what people are saying there is, this amp uses a single you know, chip 
as its amplifier versus this amp uses a bunch of transistors which together make an amplifier. Does that make sense? Yes. Now people are asking how it sounds different. Well, the answer is it really shouldn't. Yeah, you can, in theory, make excellent and or terrible amplifiers with either approach and the various subgenres of each, which we'll dive into in a bit because the uh, subtopic was going to be class A versus class, a. class ain't, um, <laughs> which should be quite interesting. But yeah, I, I think the, the big thing, which is not necessarily at all inherent to IC based op amps, but just something which tends, the products which take, take this approach tend to use IC op amps, enormous amounts of feedback, which is effectively error correction. You take the output of the amplifier, invert it and loop it back to the input. And so any distortion and noise that was present effectively gets canceled out because you're now amplifying the inverted uh, signal vers a version of that, which two opposite waves cancel each other out. That's that's kind of the Cliff Notes version of it. And amplifiers which have enormous amounts of feedback tend to provide better measured results. Um, there are both discrete and op-amp based versions which have excellent results and discrete and op-amp based versions which have terrible results. Um, my experience has just been subjectively that the ones which are the deepest into that approach tend to not sound as good as the ones which are a little bit more held back. Even and, if the and when you say is good in both cases, like, and when you say deep in, are you referring to a hundred dB or like cumulatively two hundred dB of nested feedback? Because like it, it's quite different when we talk about nested loops. Yeah. Like for a normal, let's say a normal audio op amp, like a, like an NE five five three two, you're talking about over a hundred decibels of feedback at DC. And that's pretty common to op amps, right? Uh, yeah, I don't have exact figures as to sort of where it starts and stops. I don't know what the, you know, actual gain uh, in terms of all the feedback on like a current, uh, what's it, A90 or whatever is. Um, well, the, the current A90 uses discrete op amps for the current feedback stage, I believe. It might even use them for the gain stage. So I think the okay. only way to know that would be to ask John. Right. I don't. Know or take it apart. Hmm. I haven't tried the A90D yet. I've only tried the uh, the A90, A90. I'd be really interested in you doing some sort of a blind test between them, because to my knowledge, and, and again, I know John Yang. John, you can tell me if I'm wrong here, but my understanding is that it uses the same composite feedback loop topology, which is to say that there is an output stage which has its own feedback loop, and then that output stage's output feeds into the input of the whole system so that there are two feedback loops nested within each other. Right. Okay. And this is how uh, they're John Yang may or may low. not be here, but he has me on Discord and can complain to me at any time. <laughs> we yeah, I'd be, I'd DM be occasionally back and forth about things like people measuring distortion products on headphone coils. Because, I mean, for a bit of background, um, I do ABX stuff quite a bit. This is what I use. Uh, if I can, how do I turn that off? Bloody blur. If you hold it next to your face, we can see it. Oh, yeah, it does work. Uh, there we go, there's work. So this is a ABX switcher. So there's an Arduino here. That is a big bank of relays. Uh, and then this is another bank of relays. So basically what happens is it lifts the connection. Uh, when you, in the software, click either A, B, or X after you've told it how many runs you want to do. This bank of relays, which has a lot more than are actually connected, it uses a truly random uh, switching order to shuffle back and forth and stuff. So the idea being that you can't get an audible cue as to which way it's switched or whether it has switched at all. So is it goes through it, a switching it, sequence. Is it instant, though? No. Ah, okay. No, because if it was instant, you'd... You, have potential for other tells as well, like like the DC offset thing. Well, actually, I mean the DC offset thing is technically still a thing, but um, yeah, you don't you don't want to have it instant because it can cause unfair uh, cues, and then it latches it back down again, and you can set it in the software to do uh, X number of runs, and then it'll spit out a p value and tell you what the chances of you, know, you guessing that result was. People so, say that Andrew is too quiet. By the way, oh, I've I've since changed it. Is it okay now? I can like they said that just recently. Okay, well, uh, I'm going to turn everybody else down because I don't want to clip. Um, so okay. Ro saying being aware and the operator of their own ABX does that count as a valid test? So that's the thing, 
is a lot of well, people say that they've done an ABX test or whatever when it was not a blind test. It was sighted because they knew what they were listening to at the time that they listened to it. Or even if they had someone helping them, if they were in the room and there were tells like being able to hear if someone had unplugged or plugged something in or just which way something was plugged. The whole point of this or if is it's that not it's completely matched. Or if it's not volume matched, yeah. yeah. Often it's um, not. <laughs> a lot of people, yeah, don't do that. Um, like if you're just comparing two decks and you haven't done any software volume control, you're you're not doing it right. You need to do that. Um, the whole point of this is that it's completely software controlled. It's got an ABX option. You can connect everything to it, but you can't see or tell what is running through it at any given time. There's no indicators whatsoever. You can only tell by actually listening. So uh, yes, as as long as things are properly controlled, you can do an ABX yourself. It's just that you kind of need some hardware to do it. Ours, ours was a lot more primitive. <laughs> it was Pardon just me. <laughs> Pardon well, it was me. a hardware-based system. Ours contains a high like contains one of the lowest like one of the lowest error rectifiers you can build and maintains continual continuous analog monitoring of both sides like channel match in real time with music i'm quite proud of that circuit okay so when i it's say just more not a computer primitive, it just doesn't have software yeah um, yes it's analog but where i landed on it was that if i thought i could, I could hear a difference at no point did i ever care <laughs> that's fair i was like oh, this is maybe i could maybe i could you know get it right six out of ten times maybe I, maybe not right but you know i i would get more i've said this on, on discord i'd probably get more joy tweaking my left nipple before listening you know before every listening session than going to yeah you know whatever the six out of ten preferred times to whatever that other amplifier would be and I think that's a bit of a genuine source of argument in a lot of people in the community because I, I, I review a lot of DACs and amps. They do not make as much of a difference as your headphones or speakers. Not even close. You should spend your money on your headphones and speakers. That is by far the most important thing. And if you're using speakers, your room is arguably in some cases even more important than the speakers themselves. Um, like I, I do find that they make a difference and I think it's an improvement, but you really should be spending the vast majority of your budget on your headphones, that is going to make a much bigger difference. Don't go spending, you know, two grand on a DAC and amp and then 1,000 on headphones. Don't, don't do that. You'll get a much better result by using a much more basic DAC amp combo or whatever and much nicer headphones. Although a one grand headphone may well be as good as a three yeah. grand. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Or so, even the less substantive point yeah. is <laughs> the point don't is that use a DT990 and a, a $5,000. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is anybody doing that? Yeah, I, 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 you don't remember the old days. Cameron, no, Cameron's too young. I know the HE6 is... he versus $5,000 amps was the thing, you know. Do you remember? Well, that one was a bit of a different case. Because yeah. that one wasn't really about like, oh, it scales with, you know, nicer amps or whatever. It was that actually it did require enough current that a lot of amps would start misbehaving in the realm at which it was operating. Same thing with Zvara. Like, well, things have changed a lot case, since then. Yes. Yeah, nowadays you can get plenty of different headphone amps which will drive them absolutely fine, but that was not the case. And so when people were saying, you know, oh, you need to use a speaker amp for Sysvara or HE6 or whatever, there was some truth to that. It yeah. wasn't that you need 100 watts. It's just that if your amp can only do 6 watts, it might start misbehaving and distorting way more at 1 watt or 2 watts. And so therefore, actually, you probably do want to get an amp with, which is able to output the current and power you do need whilst behaving nicely. Uh, and a lot the, of headphone amps did. The source gear mythos of that age has carried forward to the point now where yes, it's well, very... it has and it hasn't. Like, I think people underestimate how much less source gear mythosy people have gotten over time. Well, or, but also potentially that the the audience for this has grown and there are new people in it now who are not like. Oh yeah, no, I don't mean that individuals have changed. What yeah. I mean is that the community has changed. Yeah, yeah. 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 Like what I was about to reference is, and you guys are probably don't like you don't remember this, but like back in two thousand and seven or whatever, people would get DT nine nineties, eight eighties, K seven oh ones, and they'd pair them with eight hundred dollar amps, and they'd have them recabled aftermarket for five hundred bucks. Oh dear! Like that's what Moon Audio Memory Servant got their start on. Like it wasn't even detachable cables because there were a lot of things that didn't have them, but you could send in a K seven oh one and pay. Five hundred, six hundred dollars to get a silver cable added to it. Hmm. Fun. And that was once 
I wouldn't say ubiquitous by any means, but that was like something people did once they hit the ceiling of price. Um, I mean, there are still some elements where people are. I I think in uh, nowadays people are generally a bit more sensible about it, but there are also some areas of confusion, like the Modhouse tungsten. That's a good one where people are. I mean, that headphone is genuinely difficult to drive, mm -hmm. but in a different way than a Sasvara R H E six is. Um, but a lot of people are just going, I need a powerful amp, I need more power, I need 10 watts at 32 ohms, when actually that's not going to help at all. Um, Sorry, am I still am I still clipping? You sound good to us. You sound good to us, but it doesn't mean you're not clipping on YouTube. I'm not listening to you on YouTube. Yeah. Chat, is Andrew clipping? You're not clipping. You sound great. Of course I sound <laughs> Okay. No, okay, someone says never did. Okay. Okay. The balance versus yeah, single-ended yeah. debate. I mean, that's an interesting one. Well, okay, well, and I'm... also then the question of what is balanced. Yes. <laughs> did we uh, arguably did we, before we dive into that? Did we get any consensus on like, like what we're saying here is that amp DAC could be could make difference, but uh, it all depends on on uh, threshold of audibility. Can well, I? Can and, I? And, actually, and... I want to do one thing, which is because. I said my position is that sort of if something is audibly different, there is a measurable effect. You can't you can't say that something's audibly different without being having anything to point to that could possibly explain it. Right. Um but I I have not necessarily disagreements, but just uncertainty about some of the commonly put forward thresh declared thresholds of audibility. Um and one thing I wanted to talk about was, I mean, have you, Blaine, have you read through the paper by uh, Air Benjamin and Benjamin Gannon on jitter audibility? What you, which year is that one from? Uh, the 1998 one. It's the, it's the main uh, one that like people point to. Yes, but it's been a while. I remember reading a couple of things on jitter from that era, including one who had the quite amusing observation that lots of jitter sounds quite similar to analog wow. Right. Because that that paper is actually let me share my screen one second. Because this paper is an interesting one in that it's very commonly touted as a pretty definitive answer to you know how much jitter is audible. Mm -hmm. I'm not at all saying that I disagree with it. I can think you, this is a can you zoom in a bit on the paper? Yep. Just so we can see the title. There we go. Yeah, so I'm not at all saying that I disagree with this. I'm saying that I don't think that this is as conclusive as people sort of understand it to be for a fair few reasons. So basically, the summary is that this paper is looking at the audibility threshold for jitter and audible effects of jitter. Um, and it talks about sort of some of the theory and stuff behind jitter in and of itself. If we get to the actual experiment bit, which is down here somewhere. Cameron's uh, scroll wheel reviews. Yeah. Uh, so that's why i buy bit. logitech tm silent scroll oh walker. don't even don't even no, i've got the <laughs> thing i just hadn't, hadn't God, clicked it. it okay that so is... i mean the, the very first thing is that the listening tests that they did were on a sony mdr v6 which just <laughs> as a headphone <laughs> i mean as a headphone itself if i move this over it's got quite well it's not necessarily the most neutral headphone there's arguments about you know whether that's uh, the ideal tool for this kind of evaluation, especially since it's got very attenuated upper treble. Um, my personal experience has been that with jitter in particular, to comparing digital sources and stuff, usually using a DAT that lets the effects pass through, like the May, you can turn the PLL off completely, for example. Headphones with more upper treble and or better soundstage tend to be the ones that are best for that. Um, others might find different. I mean, some people say that like, you know, using speakers, for example, is more revealing of dactis uh, differences. I don't personally find that to be the case, but some people do. There's so there's questions about is the equipment they're using for the evaluation sufficient? The DACs that they're using themselves, they don't actually detail what they are, and they don't provide measurements are uh, well not comprehensive measurements of those DACs performance. So we also don't really have an answer as to are there any other effects of those DACs that might be providing some kind of masking effect, even basic things like, uh, have they got good reconstruction filters? That's something which actually you have to have if you want to evaluate Jitter properly just on a J test. Um, in the setup itself, so they've got basically a low Jitter source, it was a CD player, 
they've got this tool here which allows them to inject jitter into the digital signal itself uh, and then it goes to a DAC and they've got a switch which allows them to switch between just going from uh, the CD player via this distribution amp or including the modulated jitter, so higher jitter short source signal. They, there's things like, you know, they say that there were measurements taken to check if these distribution amps had any effect, but don't provide any. And even cables can actually influence jitter very slightly, not to any real meaningful degree, but they can still do that slightly. The thing that's most interesting is kind of this, which is that throughout the course of the uh, the testing, they they say that test subjects got better at it, sometimes by a, a factor of two or three times. And that also has shown up in various other things, I'm sure, Blaine, you've seen that. Um, in fact, in a similar topic, there was a meta study on the audibility of high resolution audio. So 44.1 kilohertz versus 192 kilohertz stuff. And again, they said that with practice, people got better uh, at discerning them. I will note that that meta analysis is driven by a number of papers with improper controls. That's fair. <laughs> like, that's a, a particular sticking point for me. Like, it's not wrong to say that there are probably cases where high res is audible, comma, if that's because of ultrasonics intermodulating into the audio band, that's not a good thing. Right. Like, it's sort of the same thing as, like, amps being audibly differentiable, right? Like, if you have an amp that is oscillating, it will absolutely be, well, not absolutely, in most cases, you will be able to differentiate it because, hey, now you've got an ultrasonic car like carrier that's modulating with your audio. Yeah. So you've got an effect there. Is it the one you want? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, well, it's demonstrably not transparent. So there's, there's that just as a starting point. Um, the jitter that they actually added to the signal, I'm trying to find where it was mentioned now. Uh, I can't remember exactly where they mentioned it in this paper, but effectively the, the jitter that they added to the signal to test audibility was fixed. It was a single sinusoid. They didn't, it wasn't uh, anything correlated to the signal itself, which is not particularly realistic to how actual devices behave. Um, actual digital sources will to some degree change depending on what you are playing through it. And Can they also use a response to a super review just because I, it's funny. Sorry, so it says, <laughs> so all amps sound the same, but what about fuses? Interesting note. Oh, yeah. One of the reasons you don't see fuses and signal paths much is that they can be differentiable because a fuse by its nature is a, uh, whether it's a poly fuse or a single use fuse is something that responds to high voltages across it. And that means that almost by definition, they have a meaningful temperature coefficient and they can introduce, in many cases, audible distortion. So you probably don't want to fuse your audio outputs. So this particular post that Dr. Olive was memeing about on Twitter, there is actually a there there. Um, no, there isn't. I mean, no, <laughs> because it's not in this signal, but... for that reason. That's like <laughs> saying, you know, like nobody builds hey. car suspensions out of fucking spaghetti. Yeah, but people but still use tube amps. Well, yeah, but they aren't fused on the outputs. No, I know. I'm just saying like, it's <laughs> people use things that are going to be meaningfully adding things to the music, you know, because, well, yeah, I, I just, I, I mostly wanted to include that one. Cause like, it's an example of where there can be an audible effect and that's why we don't do that. Right. <laughs> you know, like we design these things to avoid having the bits that, that fuck up the sound be right. used. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry, back to the jitter. Um, <laughs> so I'm just giggling. Also, Taryn is being a yes top quality troll in chat right now. Um, there's other things like they used for the uh, single, like the test tone test, because they did both test tones and actual music content. They used a four kilohertz full scale sine wave, which is a bit of an interesting choice because that's very close to our most sensitive region of hearing. And so then, especially with a headphone which actually has a bit of a, a peak at that frequency it's going to make stuff further away from that harder to hear. And so it would make more sense if you're trying to evaluate, you know, what the lowest possible threshold is to have a fundamental where, where the the distortion products produced by the jitter you're adding are going to be more audible relative to that. Hmm. So, well, I mean, yeah, but this, this just ends up back at my ultrasonic argument, you know, play a 22.1 kilohertz or whatever, 0.05 kilohertz or 22 just straight. 
nobody hears it, but the side bands can get into the audible band or just yeah. start ultrasonic and sweep it down. Until I mean, the side band have you seen the Sonic Edge IEMs? So th those are quite interesting. They were at CanGem. They literally oh, wait, used... Are those the ones that use a MEMS? No. There's uh, an air, they... air damping thing, right? Modulated ultrasound. So they are running oh. at around 400 kilohertz and they produce audio band what? content by modulating Why? the ultra. I, what? I, apparently it's very, very idea. Bad. Apparently it's very, very power efficient. I'm a little bit scared oh, sure this from a hearing damage perspective. But Wait, it's... what? So they're producing the audible spectrum from ultrasonics? Yes. Yeah, they're using it. It's... They're modulating two what? ultrasonics. This yeah. is yeah. blowing my mind right now. Why would you? It's do really that? cool. Not, they not, sounded horrible, I, but I'm, it's really yeah, cool. I'm more just. It's blowing my mind as to why you would do that. I, I, I mean, it's basically it's... how like it's how FM radio works, right? Yeah. So if you think about it, you're using a carrier and yeah. modulating it, and, and then it, the modulation product is what you want here. But it it seems to me from what they were saying that basically the main advantage is power consumption. They are ridiculously power efficient, apparently. Um, Peter Zhang, no, 400 kilohertz is not audible. The point is that if you have modulated distortion products effectively, then you can create audible band products even though the driver is running at that higher frequency. Uh, and Cameron, the same kind of... Are you able to uh, go back to the default view here? Taryn uh, just mentioned that uh, if this article is paywalled... Uh... Uh, default view? Oh, oh shit, we're doing piracy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, this is actually a paywalled article, I think. Oh, can I not show? Oh, okay. Yeah, so we can't go through it. <laughs> really? Oh, all right. Well, that sucks. I mean, okay, it well, has been pirated by someone else, so you can, if you the, use the the URL of someone who's already pirated it. The other two things that I wanted to just mention was that the entire thing is based around input jitter. At no point are they actually measuring the uh, full, well, they, they do some measurements of the jitter susceptibility of the three DACs. They don't mention what they are, but the actual audibility thresholds that they talk about when they say 10 nanoseconds or something. That's not 10 nanoseconds of jitter measured at the output. That's what they're feeding into the DAC. And different DACs are going to have different level, as they show, different levels of susceptibility to jitter um, and different types of jitter as well. Single sinusoid jitter is uh, in often, uh, in many cases, easier to sort out via a PLL than other types of jitter. And they don't discuss any of the other potential masking factors. Again, what is the reconstruction filter on the DAC? What is the noise floor of that DAC or the other distortion performance of that DAC? Is it the case that, you know, things have moved on since 1998? It's worth looking at with more than nine subjects as well. They only list nine subjects, which is not a particularly significant sample size. They don't mention how many they tested in total, but they only provide results for nine. It's, it's a great study. I'm really glad they did it, but it's not really something which you can point to and say, this is incredible. This is absolutely definitive because we don't have measurements of the output, we don't really have a massive sample size, and there's a lot of potential inter uh, interfering factors that have not been discussed at all. So what we'll do is we'll leave the link to this uh, to the AES page in the description. Yeah. So go get an AES subscription. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's It costs less than 200 a year for, for an associate membership for most people. There's Strongly a lot of really recommend really it to stuff. anyone who cares. Yep. So, something that this touches on, and this is a recurring theme. Um, shoot, was it? It wasn't Lewis Fielder. It was, um, what's his name? At a University of Waterloo, who did a whole bunch of audibility tests. Oh, I shouldn't remember his name. Anyway, he had, he had a paper, uh, which was basically just an op-ed, uh, where he talked about, like, the, the significance of different source gear, basically. Um, and the basic substance of it was, it's surprisingly annoying to pin down exactly what we can differentiate. Comma, it's pretty trivial to make an amplifier that has just and a DAC that has distortions and noise so far below what we have ever been demonstrated to hear that it can be assumed not to be an issue. Right, and that's sort of where we're at. Like whether minus sixty is the threshold or minus seventy. Does it matter if we get the products down to minus 120, minus 130, right? And with jitter, it's a bit more complicated because for the same level of jitter, uh, the frequency that the jitter is at is going to produce a different level output. That's another thing which people don't typically understand is that when you see a J test, which is what I and Amir and others publish, 
you can't directly equate the distortion products there to audibility thresholds of like harmonic distortion, for example. Well, yeah, I mean, like, well, and it should be noted that harmonic distortion is a pretty, and this is sort of more of the reasons that I do, I did my bit at the can jam thing. Um, harmonic distortion is a pretty harsh test of audibility. It's not as, we're not as sensitive to it as we are to intermodulation from very far, like from close spaced high frequency stuff. But it's still a case where there's a lot less masking than there is with music, mm -hmm. right? Now, the question, though, is, like, where does it become significant? And at what point do we say, okay, this is so far from what's ever been shown to be significant, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, that's that's the big one. Because well, that, that's the other thing is there's been times when, you know, I've been able to tell the difference between something. Would I pay a thousand dollars for the difference? Hell no. Like, uh, there's... I don't think it's about that necessarily when people are actually buying the products, though. I think it's much more <laughs> about confidence that they're not. So it's So it's less about, like... Um, you know, at what point is the threshold of, of audibility and making purchase decisions around, you know, what is, you know, more tangible with music. And I think it's more about like, for the same reason that people will use flack, for example, even if they couldn't tell the difference in a blind test between flack and, um, you know, various different 320. That OGG. Yeah, exactly. So I think people are buying it based on, uh, you know, it gives them the confidence that even, even if, the audibility threshold with music would be significantly higher than what this whatever product is producing uh, for distortion products. Um, they have the confidence that no matter what, they're not going to hear it. Well, I mean, and I hate to always throw to a Northwest AV guy, but his article on why he had a benchmark DAC way back when was basically about that, right? Like, there is, if you are a serious music lover, you're probably willing to pay extra for a lot of confidence that you are getting the undistorted sound. Now, contemporarily, there is also the problem of, well, not the problem. There is the distinction that there are people who believe that there are non-destructive ways that amplifiers alter the sound or that DACs alter the sound, if you follow me. And that's something that I think is kind of an interesting, I would consider that to be a pretty modern phenomenon. Are you meaning right. as in like good distortion, for lack of? A yeah, word. well, but they don't call it that, right? Like people say yeah. this amplifier slams, but right. you know, if you go back, you crank this back a few years, people, and by a few years, I mean a couple of decades, because apparently I'm way older internally than I, than I am physically. Um, it's more a dialogue about, oh, this is you know, this is degrading the sound in some sense. This super expensive amplifier is more true to life. But now people talk about amplifiers and DACs as having effects on the sound which are differentiable, but neither is correct, right? Like, this is a smooth amplifier. This well, is a but on that detailed... Note, but on, huh? on that note, though, it, your argument is that fidelity in general needs to... The concept of fidelity needs to die, and that oh, yeah, it's preference all the way down. Wouldn't that yeah. also apply to source equipment? Yeah, absolutely. That's why I'm never like, no, you can't enjoy a tube amp. I mean, I don't enjoy tube amps. Fucking things burn me. Don't like it. <laughs> Andrew, apparently you're too quiet. Oh, God damn it! He's always too quiet. Yeah, well. So, no, but like, if... And here's the thing. I'll go a step further. Placebo hats, too. You know, if someone has like a giant hunk of billet aluminum on their desk and they enjoy it, and it was worth their money, then great. My only issue is when people make claims about audibility that are not substantiable, really, right? And that's something that does happen a lot in the marketing at the high end. Well, but in the marketing, yes, but also in the community that's been persuaded by the thing that they just bought and confirmation bias, et cetera. Well, yeah, but I mean, the community is always kind of... Yeah. Like, the community left to its own devices will attribute mystical properties to almost anything. Yeah. No. Um, I had a related topic to that. Um, I mean, it was, is basically to what degree should people care, um, about whether well, or the amps matter, but like, I, oh, I, su I suppose like, I'm always wondering of like, how do we square basically the things that we're talking about here with the way that people normally react to, mm, let's say marketing. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, mean, I don't even think that it's <laughs> apparently you're clipping again. God damn nice. it. Nice. 
I think, I mean, the problem is that there's no way to prove that you are hearing what you say you are hearing, even if you can differentiate between two products. Because, like, um, you know, I, I ABX between stuff regularly, but ABXing isn't actually a, a good method for working out what the differences in sound between two are. It still leaves room for placebo. You know, you can... If there's something about, let's say, two decks, one of them is uh, it's got tons more second order harmonic distortion, it's way warmer sounding. And then you think, just because of placebo, that there's a bigger soundstage effect. There's nothing else that's actually there, it's not actually got that, but you just think that that's the case. Then even when you're doing a ABX test, as soon as you can differentiate between the two because of some other factor, you will associate the soundstage effect to it as well. So the ABX test doesn't say or prove that a particular characteristic is real or not. All it does yeah, is tell you whether it's... a test of differentiability. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I don't think we're ever going to have an answer to, like, you know, how do we square exactly what people are hearing subjectively, especially given as, unfortunately, a lot of the effects, you know, that no one's going to pay to do a significant study on what happens when the distortion profile varies in this particular way versus level and frequency, which applies to two whole products and there's no financial incentive well, to do this study whatsoever. And also what ha like with one particular listener, you know? Yeah, exactly. Like, as soon as you increase the sample size, you're going to end up with more challenges. Um, yeah. So um, should we go over class A versus class A? Well, I think there is something that I'd kind of like to pick at a little bit, though, because it came up a few times in chat. People were talking about, like, a community trend of people being like, you know, don't enjoy your $200 amp and buy one that costs 2000 instead. Or the same thing with, ample, you know, with, oh, that headphone deserves better, or you're not getting the real experience. And I do think that that is something that... I mean, Cameron comes out against, I come out against, obviously, because I don't really think there's any point in anyone buying a $2,000 amp. But I think it really needs to be reaffirmed. Well, This but that's ceases a... to become a useful dialogue at a point where people are just like, no, you can't have fun with the thing that you have. Well, it's, it's, right? it's what Critical always says, right? It's like, it's a goalpost shifting. Wait, are you saying the opposite? Like, like so, oh. so, so the, the issue is the, is the goalpost shifting where it's like, your evaluation or your judgment about product X doesn't count because you're not using it with X two thousand dollar or Y two thousand well, I mean, dollar you're amplifier. You're talking about this in a reviewer brain context, but I'm just talking about this in a user brain context, right? Okay. Like I'm just saying, at the point where we're saying, "Hey, guy who is enjoying a thing, don't enjoy that thing." That's yeah, stupid. I, like saying I'm... you're making a weird claim that's wrong. It's different, but people often do go to. Oh, that's not. A oh, good to try and like to enjoy that. To try and like dis like. Or dismantle... alternatively, oh, you bought the placebo thing. How dare you have fun with the placebo thing? Yeah, to try and break the spell, I suppose. Yeah, and it's on both sides. People keep doing yeah. it, and it's an asshole move from both sides. Your contention uh, is that the people who are making these claims about it's, you know, my you know the the experience is so much better with X and Y, you know, uh, source gear may actually be having a better experience well you know? I, I don't really see any reason to doubt someone's claim that they're having yeah. a good experience yeah, like yeah if yeah. someone if someone goes to an expensive restaurant and then says wow this is delicious i don't burst through the window and scream can you prove it <laughs> i mean maybe i should yeah that seems kind of in character for me it does but yeah. uh like you would say too many or conversely <laughs> or conversely you know someone goes to a cheap restaurant like wow this is great you don't have someone just showing up out of nowhere to be like, oh, but it's so pedestrian. I mean, like, <laughs> that would make you an asshole. We all agree that. Yeah. But for some reason, when it comes to audio gear, well, people... Uh... I think it's because there are situations as well, though, where people spend $2,000 for their DT990s or whatever, whatever. Like, that's probably less common than the one that is a little bit part of the source gear mythos that's carried forward from the yesteryear, which is the whole idea about like spend as much on your amp and DAC as you do on your headphone. That is a thing that I see. I've seen even like a, as recent as a few weeks ago. And um, as someone who's an, a DAC amp enthusiast, I would strongly disagree with that. Yeah, you should spend and so much more money on your headphones. They are the yeah, most important. Part. And, and so well, I think I think that there's there's. 
there's an element of breaking that trend that I do also see as as being somewhat part of the the, the I don't know the, the motivation for dismantling the spell or breaking the spell for people who are let's say persuaded by we want might say cited biases and you know confirmation biases for price and stuff like that. Well, I mean, here's the thing though: you you listen to gear cited like ultimately the experience that a user has with an object is holistic in a sense. And yes, if someone if... listens to something, has a great placebo time and says, this is worth my 5,000 bucks. You it's know, worth what their 5,000 oh, bucks. I, yeah, it is worth their 5,000 bucks. because You shouldn't buy the Lamborghini but... because it's a stupid car. They yeah. are stupid cars, but people still buy them and that's, you know, that's their call. But I would say that there is still an issue with telling other people that they need to buy t the five thousand oh, dollar placebo time so but i think that those are just two sides of the same coin it's just you can't have fun doing the thing you want to do you need to do what i want to do yeah i mean that's dumb <laughs> there's a lot of purchase justification that goes on yeah. um one other thing i just wanted to mention because uh, a couple of people were sort of discussing in chat is that there's sort of two conversations going on one in terms of where is the threshold of audibility or transparency and stuff and the other ones you know someone said that well my person sounds very different to an ef 400 um, and yeah, that's not surprising because both of those do have quite significant objective colorations to the sound and quite different. Yeah. Um, and that's the other thing is that, you know, a lot of particularly the sort of higher end stuff is ironically, objectively less good. Um, and so a lot of the stronger changes or differences and stuff that people might perceive are just because of whatever the colorations that those have. That's not for everything, but that that what is the best distortion profile and whatnot is a or very different question high to... up impedance and impedance yes. relationships um but you know what what is the best way to color the sound is a different question to where is the threshold of audibility so i just wanted to mention that because like yeah like the burst and stuff it's got very strong second order harmonics and it rises with level quite significantly as well so that's that's likely going to change sound uh, especially if your headphones require quite potentially a lot of potentially yeah there's a very fun philosophical question from Joel, or top, or not question, but comment from Joel that I just want to read out loud because I enjoy it. Uh, I, you're gonna talk about whether something exists independently. We don't. Okay, we don't have. We don't have to go into it. But I like. The <laughs> don't, listen, as much as I like traumatizing listener, and as much as I agree <laughs> that there is an interesting epistemic argument to be had here. Yes. I think that the argument that Cameron and I are discussing is much more grounded Relevant? in <laughs> well i mean we're talking normatively here basically yes, we're saying yes. what should you do yeah i i think my answer is you you can't tell just based off you know what people say on head and stuff whether you're going to like something generally speaking just because there's so much influence from confirmation bias and purchase justification and what re reviewers have said and all this kind of stuff and that does have an impact on what people actually perceive. If someone says that they are perceiving something, it's not necessarily that they're lying about it to try and get you to buy whatever they had or whatever. It's that, you know, they can still be being influenced by all of the information that they had received before and after they received the product. I mean, how many times have you guys seen it where an owner of a product comes and watches and comments on a review of that product, despite the fact that they've already bought it? Yeah, I mean, I kind, I think I still slightly disagree. Because I think there's a sense in which these people are lying to themselves and that they, upon breaking the spell, are better off than they were before, even if they're enjoying, even if the experience is no longer as magical to them. So I think they've learned like, something, you know? Like, you know, power cables and fuses. There is literally, other than some real edge cases like the RAL and whatnot, there is no evidence at all that they make any difference the james randy foundation for those who know uh, james randy he had an That's open one million dollar prize available to anyone who was able to differentiate between two speaker cables yeah, on a blind that. test yeah. and no one two was able speaker to cables it. under quite strict terms and yeah, it should be well, noted you can make a speaker cable that will be audibly different yes it's just and i think one, one company did try to do that but then when they said well we need to take the cables apart and make sure that you've not put anything stupid in them they said oh actually we've changed our mind um the funny thing blaine is that fact. is that your statement there I... is something that could get you canceled in certain circles Wait, what is? well not canceled but like just there are people who think that there is no scenario where a cable makes a difference okay but the thing is i don't really think that there are or at least i don't there think no that reasonable there, scenarios. there are 
Like, I think that there are a tiny share of people who will say, absolutely, there's no way for this to impact the sound. But I think that we inflate this tiny group of straw men into an army of people by conflating them with the people who are simply saying uh, cables don't matter as a shorthand for a cable that is not damaged and is functioning I don't know. properly I, doesn't matter. I think people have read the headlines, and as a result of reading the headlines, it's formed a general consensus, which doesn't include the nuances of the affir the aforementioned, you know, uh, there are certain edge cases where you could you could make one that would be measurably different. And there are bad cables. Like, yeah. that's the thing. There are absolutely cables which will have an impact, not because they are, you know, very expensive and made of the finest silver and blessed by the Pope and whatnot, but, but just because they're bad and there's a uh, really, really high capacitance or really you know, measurable impedance or whatever. Um, but you don't need to spend that much to get good ones. Yeah. That's the but I. A lot of really expensive ones are actually just, uh, like, fucked. Okay, so <laughs> I've got to take the bait from chat. Yeah. Why is it that silver makes things brighter? Is it just because the... silver is brighter colors? No, but it's like also because silver like starts a... with an S, so you have the consonants effect. That's true. <laughs> it just seems like such a clear example of where it has to be placebo. Oh. <laughs> you know? Well, Danger Zone says, Passion for Sound found a big difference in audio cables. A lot Did of he, though? Have said that they've... A lot of people have said that they found differences in cables, and a lot of people have said that they found differences with those acoustic dots and stuff. Like, like you know, the, the, this this is actually on my list of topics to get into the snake. The, what is snake oil? <laughs> like, where the okay. threshold is? I mean, so, for so me, because this is this is the thing, as as we sort of touched on earlier, is there's a lot of stuff in you know DAX and amps and whatever where it it may be audibly discernible, but it's so small that most people just would not care, let alone want to pay money for it, and that's totally fine. And I think there are a lot of instances where people will cry snake oil because something isn't worth the money to them. And that's not what snake oil is. Snake oil is when something is making a claim that it's doing something or an improvement or whatever, and it and it just isn't. That's I, I don't know. I, I have... Some... Oftentimes, though, and I, like, I get the antagonistic sentiment towards people who are making claims about, you know, differences in amps and dax and stuff like that because there are situations where people are doing uh they're, they're trying to demonstrate these differences with with tests that are completely weird um the one that comes to mind is the one that was being done at CanGem between the alex and the utopia with different cables and b they weren't right. even using the same headphone yep and and, it, and to me it's like and, and it, you know like the whole thing where they're like oh yeah like you will prefer the Alex, you know, over the Utopia with this cable. And actually, it, I mean, like, I can see... Oh, no, I mean, like, let nobody think that there are not people in this industry who are absolute scam artists. And there yeah. is nowhere that they are more common than in the cable sector. Yeah. Like, the number of cable brands that are not out and out attempting to deceive their customers is shockingly low, and it sickens me. Yeah. And I think... I'm I'm actually going to I'm going to push it. Can we all co-sign that? Like that's fucked up. Yeah, I would agree. There there's a lot of stuff in the kind of snake oil sector where I mean even with cables themselves to some degree, I'm sure a lot of them genuinely you know think that it's what they're saying is true and that they've got a measure uh, a audible improvement and whatnot and you know I I've got some expensive cables. Uh, bought from people who, you know, it costs that much because they genuinely spend that much on materials and it took them hours to make it. And I, it's basically audio jewelry. It's like, you know, putting uh, nice rims on your car it doesn't make it go faster. It just makes you smile a bit when you get in it. That's totally fine. If you want to buy cables for aesthetics or feel good factor, that's okay. But there are a lot of people in the cable sector selling fuses and quantum resonators and quantum stickers that it's like, at what point is this actually just taking advantage of vulnerable people? and gamming them out of their money it's I, I, some of it you just you get a headache reading through the marketing now here is the, this is topic number two here we're, we're we're past the amps and dax things i think topic number two it's it's at what point is something snake oil um and i want to relate this a little bit to uh what you just described about you know quantum stickers and, and so on like there's the obvious examples like that I but have to ask if Peter, Z Peter Zhang in chat is trolling. I think he is. <laughs> it's it's not snake oil cables make more difference than headphone itself. Oh, that's yeah. got to be trolling. Yeah. Okay. Right. 
But anyways, so the the question I want to ask you guys is, do we extend the same designation of audio foolery to driver stories? Yeah. You do? Yeah. What about you, Cameron? Although, um, uh, no. Could, I also again, don't. For, for me, the de uh, snake oil means something is making a claim about doing a particular thing, and it is not doing that thing. Uh, in, you know, head cables and stuff, it'll make something brighter or make something darker or whatever, when it quite clearly is not changing frequency response or distortion or any other thing that you can show at all. That's snake oil. If something is saying that, you know, it like, even with certain, okay, so as I said, in certain instances, cables can make a difference. In fact, maybe we can do a practical demonstration in a sec. Like digital cables can have a very, very small effect on jitter. Almost never to the point, assuming you've got a decent one, to the point that it's going to be anything you can hear, let alone anything close to just changing the source. But um, it's not technically snake oil because it is doing something. But when something is claiming, like, you know, the quantum field resonating well, whatnot, it's like, it's I, no, it's not. It's... What, what, what about the, uh, have you read any of the marketing material from AudioQuest? I mean, okay, so AudioQuest <laughs> is a company which, uh, like, I've, I've not uh, verified any of their claims about the, the characteristic impedance stuff. It's interesting because a lot of the stuff is technically true, but then with a lot of very subjective weighting put on it. It's the there subjective also... language. It's like, what in the hell? Yeah. This is just like, it's, you may as well just like read a book. It's like a, it's fiction. It's a storybook, you know? It's like not it's even like, trying to be, you know? I use an AudioQuest power conditioner because, mostly for safety, but also just because it's demonstrably the most effective power conditioner that I've actually tested. So, you know, they can say whatever they like subjectively about it. I pay no weight to that. It's the fact that mm. noise go down most. So why not? Even if that has absolutely no effect, it's, as you say, just a sort of confidence thing. In fact, power conditions are probably quite a good example of that because a lot of people will cry snake oil and say, you know, there's no difference to products and whatnot. And in many cases, that's absolutely going to be true. It's going to make no difference whatsoever. But it is doing what it says on the tin. It is demonstrably reducing noise and it provides effective protection. So... It's, it's, I, I wouldn't call that snake oil. You can make arguments about the value of it, but it's not It's not snake oil because it is doing what it says on the tin, even if you think it's nonsense. Even if you think it's not worth, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so to get back to driver's story, the reason why I don't think that is snake oil, well, there are situations where it can be, but I think the driver's story is interesting so when we say driver story, what are we meaning? Um, something <laughs> along the lines of, um, well, let's take a let's take a uh, probably one of the more egregious examples of this is Hi-Fi Man's Stealth Magnets, right? And and they are putting this on the box for like lots of their lots of their headphones to the point where it's become a marketing keyword that even you know I've seen even in videos from I think Joshua Valor. At one of his videos was stealth magnets at a hundred dollars or whatever the price tag of the four hundred SE was, and so it is a. These are things that are uh, having an effect, having an impact on um, the potential buyer interest, right? Uh, but the reality is, is that the stealth magnets, um, with the the rounding of the edges of the magnets, can absolutely have an acoustic effect, and so to me, I it. The idea that, okay, we can tell people we're doing this cool acoustic thing with this particular story that they're going to have an easier time understanding is not nothing. It's, I think that there are times when it goes to, when, when basically it goes too far or that the community runs away with it, you know, because they're left to their own devices unchecked and nobody tells them that, hey, actually, this is what the difference is or that, you know, there's very, in these cases, there's, no to insignificant difference, um, you know, uh, or in inconsequential differences. Um, and they might think, let's say erroneously, oh, no, but this is where the detail gets better is if it's using this part of the driver story or this part of the, uh, the so, technology story. So I'm to me, it's like hot... it's it's a matter of degree. That's that's what all I'm saying. My so hot we... take would just be that subjective marketing is OK. You just need to also be prepared to give some kind of substantiation or evidence for what, like you know, when you look at a yeah. car, at the marketing for a Porsche or whatever, they are demonstrably very high-performance cars. No one's really going to argue that. 
But there's also a bunch of, you know, fluffy subjective marketing about how you feel connected to the road and stuff. And you can't disprove that. But it's kind of okay because, like, no one's just going to throw out a spec sheet and nothing else. That's unreasonable to ask any brand in any manufacturing. Well, but, but beyond that, though, it's like the, the driver's story, like, if you're, it, not again, not in all cases, but in, in many cases, what they're describing in their technological, you know, our thing is more better, more good, or because of X technology that we've developed that we put into this thing. Um, that is actually having a consequential effect on the measurable thing, right? Like on, it's just that they're not focusing on the measurable aspect of it, right? They're focusing on the, you know, what's the thing that's going to be more resonant with the people who are reading this marketing material. And I don't so really have a driver's story. That. I want to be specific about what I mean. Okay. When you said driver's story, I thought you were talking about, oh, this one is gold plated versus silver plated for the conductors on a planner. That goes into the snake oil bin. Okay, but what about okay, but what about using PEK versus PET versus using, you know, like, uh, yeah. Well, no. I mean, the thing is, when does it matter, right? Like, if I have the same moving mass and a generally s similar structure for the dia for like for the coil, then the conductor material doesn't matter, right? But if I, I mean, don't, then it does. The right? I'm, gold I'm changing its can. actual. Like, well, right. so I can. It, so it can right. matter because diff the same amount of silver or gold changes Z. And so if you're going for the same Z, you get a different weight of your trace, right? Yeah, well, not just that, but also just the actual malleability of the, uh, the material. Like uh, Ryan from Modhouse, because he experimented with both silver and gold drivers and uh, ended up with the gold ones. And his, well, it seemed that basically because the gold was, obviously there's going to be different weights and everything, but more flexible effectively. Not because yeah, it's I mean, more expensive. I think but... we experiment. No, I mean it has it has durability. Well. Like there are durability issues with using certain materials for conductors. Mm -hmm. Like there are practical reasons. What I mean is that some people will say, "Well, I mean, like Focal, as much as I like the company in some respects, makes a lot out of using beryllium for their diaphragms. Yeah. And well, yes, uh, beryllium is a very stiff material. Not just Focal, but it's, it's, it's a, the idea, put, being able to put beryllium on a box is a thing that people want to do. Yes, so... Scratch and sniff. The, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's <laughs> dangerous. Um, for those not in the loop, beryllium is a carcinogen. Please do not lick your drivers from your Focal headphones. Um, anyway... <laughs> So no, but it's one thing to say, yes, this has material properties that are useful in this application. And that's clearly not placebo. Like, that's clearly not snake oil. It's not snake oil to say, oh, we've used copper in this instead of aluminum because it's more conductive, right? What's placebo is say it being more conductive makes it sound better. And there are people who think that simply using gold, one-to-one -one swap for the topology of the trace for everything else will sound warmer or brighter right. or what have you what i mean like and beryllium sounds more detailed and that is an extension of the cable means yes but i think that that's also not necessarily the fault of the manufacturer putting beryllium on the box i think that's the fault of the person who is making that jump from product x uses gold or whatever and is warmer or uh, you get what i mean right uh therefore th uh this is going to translate over to this other product that has a completely different design. Um, yeah, I mean, well, it depends on how it's marketed. Like, it, a lot of it depends on how it's marketed. I don't think that Ryan, for example, has done anything wrong in how he markets his drivers. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe he has. I don't know. I haven't paid that close of attention. Uh, nothing he has seen has made me want to indict him. <laughs> I mean, his, his approach was basically just try a bunch of stuff and get feedback on it and pick what people like the best. So that was a pretty decent way of going about it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we see if we can measure I just wanted to... in cables. What's that? <laughs> We've already demonstrated it, though. I yeah, don't know can, if we need I to. Mean, <laughs> you can just have a cable load that is significant relative to your source impedance or your load impedance. It's, it's like, like a snake. Dumb. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so heavy that it'll actually just wrench the BNC connectors off of your device yeah. if you don't have something to support the cable. Let's let's ask the yeah. chat. You guys want to see? You guys want to watch Golden measure a, a cable to see if there are differences? <laughs> what does what does Resolve think of planar base? I don't know. They do be having it. They yeah.
they they well extended. I see one person saying yes. Honestly, cheap Amazon cables are probably better than the Sysvara stock cable anyway. I think a coat hanger might be better than the Sysvara I think they've changed it. They've <laughs> finally changed the horrible IV tube I... one. The catheter. Okay. Yes. People don't want. Nobody is saying they want. <laughs> the <Gotcha>. cable measurements. <laughs> <laughs> All right. One person said don't yes. Buy one, one cables, person please. wants it. Well, we do have a video on this channel that actually does talk all about uh, measurable differences in cables and the scenarios yeah, where I mean, they it's, encounter that. You can you can make it happen. It's just the question of how far do things have to go into a weird space for that to happen? Yeah. Um, the one that I wish that I had done, because it came out like right after I did that video, was the uh, that I am from Let's Sure. The, the good one, the... Cadenza 12. The Cadenza? Yeah. Um, that one has done linear impedance and would actually, like, you could, you could in theory, find a cable that would uh, meaningfully change the sound. And actually, uh, this is something that Zeos, <laughs> of all people, ended up discovering. Um, now, he was obviously doing it subjectively, and then someone actually um, tried to measure it. Uh, and sure enough, it ended up being quite a bit darker as a result. I think IEMs are probably the one situation where there's more chance for a cable because where they are generally so low in impedance and also many and of so reactive, reactive and non-linear in impedance, uh, there's more chance for both the impedance of the cable and the capacitance of the cable to actually have an effect. That does not mean go and buy a expensive one. In fact, for capacitance, it mostly just mean buy a shorter one. Um, yeah. So it, well, it's well, capacitance is a weird meme in cables because it doesn't matter for headphones. Like you're not going to do a half depends mile on the output long. Put impedance. I get. I mean, if you're using like a low impedance IEM with a high output impedance source, which you shouldn't do anyway. But well, okay. But like, if we're thinking about this, how much? Because if you think about it, you're forming an RC low pass, hmm. and that matters when it's really long, and you have a high source impedance. But headphone amplifiers have typically less than one ohm output impedance. And the headphone cable is typically less than 100 meters long. So you're not, unless you're really worried about playing music for your bats, it's not a, like the the ability of it to be impactful is really limited. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm just meaning that like, whereas with headphones, it would need to be something extreme. With IEMs, there's a at least a chance that something that people would just come across might have a very small impact, potentially. But again, and I can't reiterate this enough, it doesn't mean go and buy expensive stuff. It means just think about it a bit. Yeah. So, uh, so we didn't get to Class A, which I kind of wanted to And we also about. didn't get to the, uh, we each have to choose an amp and a DAC that we like and explain why. So did you want to circle back to Class A versus Class Ain't? I do. Okay, let's do that. Cameron? Let's do it. So we really need to do a video on this. Yes, we do. Cameron and I are thinking about this. Um, so consider this a draft, I guess. But everyone says everything is class A and 99.9% .9 of them are liars. Yeah, I, I think the first thing to address is why manufacturers are doing it in the first place, which is that there are a lot of people in the community that have uh, misconceptions about the fact that class A inherently sounds different or has a uh, warmer characteristic or whatever, when actually that's not true. Uh, and the, I think the reason that this misconception exists is simply because a lot of the amps that were class A were designed in a way that meant they had uh, a higher, like, a similar kind of thing to the R2R situation. All the people say that, oh, R2R is inherently warm. Well, it's not. It's just that most R2R decks have really, really high distortion. Um, but ones with lower distortion, you don't get that same effect. With Class A stuff, as long as it is actually objectively a lot better than some of the older stuff, you, you won't have the same effect. Class A and Class AB shouldn't have an inherently different sound. But because a lot of people think that they do, and a lot of people are therefore going, I need Class A because it's inherently better, a lot of manufacturers are labeling things as Class A, even if they are not Class A. Yes, and that brings us to what is Class A, which is something where we get into, and I really I really love this one because the definitions of Class A used by a lot of companies would imply that the cheapest off-the-shelf op-amp is Class A, 
So class A usually means the, con the transistors that conduct the output don't turn off, right? So in its simplest form, it means that the same amount of power is being dissipated at all times. It's just either it goes to the headphone or speaker, or it goes to your output transistor, which sinks the like, which is heat sink, and that just turns into a room heater. <laughs> um, this is the most baseline form of class A, right? And that requires that that transistor never turns off. The only question is: is the current flowing through the headphone, or is it staying inside the amplifier? But you're going to burn it up one way or another. The more common approach for contemporary class A is to take a class B output, which is by its definition, something where it conducts ideally for exactly half the waveform and put a constant current through it, which basically holds both sides of it on. The, uh, the trouble about this is that that's also what they do in every single class B op amp and every single class B amplifier, because if you don't, then your class B output stage turns off during the switchover and then you get horrible distortion that's called zero crossing distortion. The easiest so, way to check if something generally speaking, or the easiest way to eliminate something from being class A is if you have just like a kilowatt meter, you know, a power consumption thing. Does the amount of power that the amp is pulling from the wall change as you turn it up? If it does, it ain't class A. Yep. And it, and it will never, no true class A will ever vary in how much power it draws. Now, Especially anything that is not being used to drive the output is just converted to heat. Yep. And, and when we say true class A, what we mean is single end class A, basically. And this gets us into the ambiguity of where does it stop being class A, I'm right? I'm post uh, Jason's... Yeah, Jason Stoddard this, really had good, a quite actually. amusing blog on this. I had a couple of gripes with it, but... Like, he considers a Class B output stage that is in the fully biased area to be Class A. I don't. Mm -hmm. uh, if it can turn off the transistors, it's not Class A. It's operating in Class A, but it's also not really behaving as you would consider a Class A output stage to behave, and because they do not cross over perfectly, it's not the same. Man. I think the big problem is just that even in those situations, most of most of the amps that are labeling themselves as Class A, like Syncer SA1, I love that amp. It's a fantastic amp. It's not Class A. Um, well, it, it, is, it, it is Class A by the definition of having a constant bias as long as you don't need a lot of power. Yes, but that's the problem, is that that's Class AB. That's kind of the yeah. whole point of Class AB. And so a lot of amps which are Class AB but just happen to have a reasonably high Class A bias are now labeling themselves as Class A, when that's not what that means. It's like going back to car analogies. You might have a very fast car, but if you call it turbo and it doesn't have a turbo in it, it doesn't mean it's turbocharged. It's just quick. Yep. And it's a bit of a problem, really, I think, because a lot of people do actually pay quite a lot for Class A. And then what are they getting, you know? And of course, you know, there is the question of if they enjoy it, does it matter? But it seems to me misleading, at least. I mean, there's also then the sort of two linked questions of one, uh, why would people want, or why would Class A be better, particularly for headphone amps? Because uh, speaker amps is a bit of a different question, but also... Because well, it opens up why... the sound. <laughs> well, I mean, there, there, and there is a, a clear empirical reason to prefer class A, and that's that it eliminates several of the major forms of distortion that can occur in an amplifier. Yeah, like, particularly high output. Yeah, well, not even then, though. Also at low output, because you don't have any zero crossing, right? Yeah. Like, you have, it is the sound of one transistor clapping. But and is that this... has a lot of technical merits. Supposing What's you that? do not care about the heat or the <laughs> power or anything to do with that. Is there a, a benefit to class A over class AB? Well, yeah, I said it eliminates like three different distortion mechanisms. And also, like, it can be, can be, not necessarily is, but can be lower noise, can be meaningfully lower distortion, is simpler in terms of its part complement. 
it doesn't run any risk of being overheated in use, assuming because if it, if it is capable of surviving being on, it is capable of surviving literally any use. Right. But um, it's also not, you're saying is it's not a sufficient condition for goodness. No, I mean, you can build an absolutely appallingly yeah. bad class A amplifier and you can build an extremely good class B amplifier. No. And in many cases, biasing a class B amplifier towards class A actually makes it behave worse. Hmm. Right. I think um, one thing that's sort of a little bit different between obviously headphones and speakers is in in speakers, if you need, you know, 100 watts of uh, amplifier power for your speakers, that's, you know, 200 watts per channel. Assuming you've gotten 50% efficiency, which even for a class A amp is pretty good, that's like 400 watts of heat at least being dumped into your room uh, and on your power bill, which is not particularly appealing. So class A for speakers is often a bit of a challenging proposition just because especially if you need more power the actual you know physical build of that amp needs to be pretty substantial it is probably going to be quite a bit more expensive whereas with headphones you know the the benefits of class ab in terms of the efficiency and stuff aren't really as much like there's lots of actual class a headphone amps that don't have particularly high power consumption well when we say lots of actual i can think of like five Okay, but yeah, but I mean, well, <laughs> HM1, take that for example. You know, that's actual class A. Um, and yeah, because actual... headphones need a couple of watts at most. Yeah. So I guess uh, the question that many people might be wondering is why aren't more headphone amps class A? Why are there so many class AB headphone amps? Excusing the op amp, you know, like not being able to design a discrete whatever. Well, it should be noted you can make oh, yeah. for the definition of. So there's there's two things. You can actually make a class A output op amp based amp. All you'd need to do is put a transistor, a single transistor on the output and connect it to the op amp. And in fact, I know that Burson has done that before, but I don't think they did it as a class A. They did it as a class B output stage and they biased it, and I don't know why. <laughs> um, but it's like it's very doable even if you want to do minimal engineering. It's just sort of like I think the answer is because nowadays people like in the era where people didn't care about power, why would you spend the money? But nowadays people care quite a lot about amplifier power, and Class A will never have the same marketed power into particularly well into low impedances, which is where people look at power. So, I mean, the power thing is a bit of a weird one, just because we've spoken about this several times. But headphones have been, generally speaking, getting easier and easier to drive, and amps been getting more and more powerful. Everything's just kind of Ships going off passing the directions right. yes Which i mean a weird one. and then you you still have headphones yeah. like the tungsten where there's not actually many headphone amps that can actually drive them properly because everything's focusing on you know power at 32 ohms rather than output voltage capability well and the tungsten is i would argue the tungsten is a case of where the design should probably have been reworked to have a, a lower z just because what does the single-sided one have a lower z no uh, no no, double-sided, it's like 3 dB more sensitive. Oh, he did yeah. have some more sensitive ones, but basically he wasn't able to do so whilst keeping a sound that he was happy with, so he ended up with this in the end. Yeah, so and the reason for that, that I said that, is that there's a threshold, a very specific number, and it's about 11 volts RMS, that you really, if you get beyond that, the pool of amps that will be able to output that much is much smaller. Yeah, but that's part and of the reason of is because. Well, and it's not because it's particularly harder to design a discrete amplifier that way, but that's because that's the point where you can get to with an op amp running off of the rail, the voltage rails that yeah. op amps like running from. Almost everything is either 10 volts or 20 volts. Yeah. Uh, there are very few headphone amps which go above 20 volts. Yeah, and 20 in this case is balanced. I have background right. noise, do I? Yeah, but it's fine. Don't worry about it. Not much. I can fix it. One second. Don't worry about it. Um, but yeah. so like, and of course, balanced is a solution for things like the tungsten. Like if I was going to design an amp for the tungsten and I wanted it to be cheap and functional, I would do it with, a with, a differential output stage you just because make, then you, hey, you should I make an amp. I literally am working on three amps <laughs> right now. I know. I know. I'm just trolling you. <laughs> and one of them is discrete single ended class A. Fun. Yeah, in that one, the, the guy who says that amps don't matter is making the most meme amp. The, 
Well, it's okay. You'll be able to put Class A on the, the box. <laughs> I know it would be like even just a really unsafe no protection whatever just the sound of one transistor clapping i still want to hear that dude i sent dms uh like that amp like i sent him the pcbs i made i made a version of the zen amp that was simpler than the zen amp mm. i should send you that schematic it's quite easy to build the I mean, it's going okay. to be appalling let me be clear i would not sell this no yeah but... just just out of curiosity it's well, and it's fun to do those sorts of designs, right? Because they're so, I mean, it is Zen. I, as someone who disagrees with Nelson Pass on almost every single philosophical portion of audio, like particularly, I really don't like his whole anti-feedback stance. What's your thoughts on uh, his stance on second order harmonics being inverted versus absolute phase? Have you read that? I haven't read that. <laughs> I can see you getting a headache already, so I won't say anything further. But so I have a lot of disagreements with Nelson Pass, but I really do agree with him about how just nice single ended class A is to design. It's so elegant. Now, of course, it's elegant because it's an inefficient archaism, but that's sort of like saying, oh, why would you use a rake? You know, it's like, oh, you could get like an earth mover. Yeah, but sometimes I want to tend my Zen garden. I, I mean, generally, though, why is it that we don't have more Class A amps? Because they are simpler to design. A lot of the amps that even are Class AB and stuff, they just, like, I mean, take a Topping A90. The chassis of that's quite nice. It should really have sufficient heat dissipation just with that, without much modification to well, design a different product inside. It would have sufficient heat dissipation to design a 1-watt Class A, yeah. right? And the thing is... The pool of people who know the difference between class A, B, biased heavily into class A and through class A, whether you consider that to be push pull or single ended class A. Personally, I think push pull class A does count as true class A. But, I'd say uh, so. That's as long as the transistors it. are not actually turning off, I, I yeah. still count that. I, I think modulating the current source is not cheating, like it's just efficient. Um, but Anyway, the and uh, we should 100% do a video. Like, I'm going to mock up some things where you can actually look at the current waveforms and the transistors, and people will be able to see how different class A designs actually operate. But, uh, this is this, right. This is uh, the reason I don't think it's done is because it means advertising a product that, well, okay, your power supply requirements are actually meaningfully different. Yes. So, sure. like, if you think about it, if I'm building a class B amplifier, my my reservoir capacitors only need to be big enough to cover however long the peaks I'm intending this to work for. My heat sinking only needs to be good enough to deliver max power for an instant because nobody is listening to a max volume square wave on a headphone amp. Well, I hope not. But with class A, everything needs to be running at 100% the whole time. And that does actually meaningfully raise your parts cost and it means that for a given footprint you have really limited output power and both of those things are like poison to the audiophile market because like why would i cut my advertisable power and increase my costs on something that everyone else would be like well this class a has less power than that class a i mean i think the only successful class a that wasn't stupid expensive was the like the original Asgard, frankly. That was was, was that actually class A? I thought that was just high biased A B, wasn't it? Nope. Single edit class A. The original Asgard was single edit class oh, A. Oh the original Asgard, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, the OG Asgard was and the thing is it didn't do that well. Mm. Like and of course two maps. People are noting single ended triodes. Obviously a single ended triode almost by definition is going to be Class A because when you have a single output device, you can't really not be. Chad is asking if you can uh, tip your fedora. Uh, let's see, hold on, I have something. That's gonna be a gift in there. the next couple. Of days. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we do have to move on to the next topics. Um, okay. What do each of us consider to be a great amp and a great DAC? If you could only have one. Great. 
So yes. is price no object, or are we allowed to factor in? Like, are we allowed to factor in price? No, just pick. Well, you can. But like, pick, is it something that I get to own? Do pick, I get to sell it? No, like just pick pick a thing that you think is great. Just one thing, and you can. Maybe it's Adam. Okay, sure. Cameron. Um, for Dax, I, I really like the Hollow May. That's the most accurate native PCM converter you can get, besides, I think, that new TI chip that just came out. Um, and so just the kind of objective performance, the fact that there's no possible fuckery from uh, digital stuff going on or whatever. It's just nice. It's very expensive, but I like it. The HM1 is great because it's objectively very well performing, the design of it is single-ended class A. It's very nice in terms of just elegance. The features on it are great. Mixing and having EQ, all that kind of stuff. At a more affordable price point, the SA1, I really like for the money. It drives just about everything. Sounds great. Objectively great. Uh, and I that honestly, I mean, going back to the discussion about um, how much of a difference and stuff, get an SA1 and then just stop until you've gotten all the headphones you want, pretty much. <laughs> and get into EQ. Uh, yeah. uh, for me, uh, my big thing, uh, and my I grant that my use condition is very different from most people, but my big thing with amps and DACs is versatility. I need to be able to run uh, sensitive IEMs and power-hungry planars. Um, so uh, there's a reason why I use the stack that I do, which is the Matrix X Cyber Pro and the Violetric HPA V550 Mark II. And it's because there is a lot of versatility and versatility of outputs too. So useful in that regard. But that's not to say that it's the best thing at that price. I have no idea. <laughs> I just use it because it's versatile. What um, I really like about the about the Atom, and I have to I have to shill JDS here. They're a company that really doesn't get enough credit. And, and I talk about this behind the scenes sometimes and when it comes up, but like When's the last time you heard about a JDS amp having a severe failure mode? Oh, right. Oh, we we actually broke it. Uh, you broke one? No, not me specifically, but um, you know the. <laughs> it was Chris. <laughs> you know the yeah. the middle bit that lights up. Yes. He thought it was a button, so he pushed it, and it pushed into the. <laughs> it just okay. detached from the front, <laughs> so okay, he broke it. So... <laughs> So that's where we get into user error. <laughs> but what I mean is that in a world where expensive amplifier blows up is a fairly common headline. Oh, yeah, this one. Oh, it's not that expensive. I just still don't really know what happened with this. Which it just, one? The, the shit Midgard. It just, uh, oh. it just is now like pure distortion no matter what I do. <laughs> so I mean, I that's. I to, be fair, well, to be fair, <laughs> the Midgard has. When I heard what Jason was doing with that, I was like, wow, it takes some real cojones to put that out on the market because that is like a recipe for having destructive failure. Um, but uh, anyway, no, but like the JDS stuff, you never hear about that because they're just humble, you know? They're not going for the absolute top Synad number. They're very conservative designs. They work. They have features that users want they're cheap. They don't melt headphones. Yeah, it's just like, it's really nice to see that. I mean, I know that Benchmark is what I should pick because they have, you know, the technical marketing. They've done a lot of extremely good work for a lot of, for a very long time. But I just like the fact that JDS doesn't really get involved in the whole marketing hype race and just keeps delivering products that just work. It's nice. I wish more it, companies did that. And they don't agree. release stuff every five minutes for the sake of it either like they release something when there's an actual reason, reason to, so, to which is nice because there's it's getting hard to keep up with some of the companies that release slightly different colors of the same thing every 10 days and i mean like i think that it's hurt them not being in that i mean with a little bit has got to be, I mean, well, there's companies which are continuing to do it, so there's got to be some reason that they are doing it. Um, and just based on some of the discussion, there is some serious fear of missing out that goes on. And I'm sure that leads to a certain you know, increase in sales. I'm sure there are also a lot of people who don't buy because they know that it'll be outdated within a week. But 
I think GDS's main issue, honestly, is that there's, they're not particularly prominent in terms of marketing. Like, I can't remember the last time I saw even just like a sponsored head fight post or something. I don't even know if they do that. And uh, not that, you know, marketing has any influence on the sort of product itself, but it's it's kind of a shame because I wish more people got their hands on JDS stuff. It's really good. Someone in chat says topping is an industry plant. What does I don't that even, even mean? begin to understand what that means. Yeah, I don't understand that. 90% marketing. I mean, are they? I think the only marketing I've seen from them is basically sending stuff to Amir. Yeah. Um, well, and making weirdly extended pages for Shenzhen Audio. Yeah. I mean, their marketing is winning the Sin Ad Wars, right? <laughs> I mean, and you know, that's if that's what people want, then hey, why not? You know? Well, we should yes. talk more about the oscillation thing. Uh, yeah, know, like stability that. is. A criteria that is really neglected <laughs> in modern amps. Topping is Tyler Hurtson's daughter. <laughs> what? Like, both the fact that in the last, well, actually, in almost any given year, there will be a shit amp and a topping amp that has some repeatedly occurring failure mode where it melts down is not good. Chef Steve, that you is know? bad advice. Because then you're going to get people buying one thing that makes no difference to an and from another thing that they had that also makes no difference just yeah, waste just, just just that buy gds man understand like because i mean regardless of where you personally fall on the sort of you know feeling about amps and dax and stuff making a difference the majority of toppings audience i think are more on the there is a level of cyanide or whatever that it's transparent and it doesn't matter past that. So why do they keep making like new and new stuff with 0.2 dB more and that's more exp like they've got some new flagships and stuff which are really expensive coming out. Like, I don't, I mean clearly they must sell but I don't quite understand the target consumer for those. I mean I do. I Who? The the point two percent or whatever, or the point zero or whatever percent incremental improvement crowd. But it, but if the, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. I know, right? but they don't and realize it that. Does That's matter, what I'm saying. Uh, like it's it's like it's just as dumb as people buying things because of whatever the marketing is. You know, that's that. Mm -hmm. Like if you just trust a company, you're like imagine that you went into audio taking everything that every audio company says at face value and believing all of it <laughs> i have a what would, hell of a what lot would of you end up with? rocks and usb <laughs> <Maybe. re-blockers> and <laughs> yeah would they, would they get that one thing that you can plug into your speakers where it's supposed to be like a telepathic tweeter what oh you've not seen that someone's selling no. something where it's supposed to make a direct psychic connection to you to be in the high frequencies yeah I mean, like okay. this is, but this is what I'm saying is like there are, the the people who are like the literalists, right? Who like can't, they can't, you know, see the forest for the trees, and they take everything at face value, and they, everything is verbatim. I I feel like it's just like this, the other side of the coin of the person who just believes everything that the marketing tells them. Oh, in fact, I'd probably save money because there's that new company where their headphones can just be set to sound like any other headphones. Oh, yeah. So can yeah. Sell everything and <laughs> we're good. We'll get that one. <laughs> we really need that. To we should do a video that. on that one. That one we should. I think DMS I mean, has it, got some coming in, if I remember correctly. The concept of selling convolution filters is interesting, but a lot of their claims are very dubious. Was that what they Yeah. I mean,. There, well, no, it's it's a headphone which basically has preloaded EQ presets, or I don't know if it's doing it via convolution or EQ or whatever. Um, but well, they yeah, say I mean, that it's not just the the LTI stuff. They're claiming that it also includes the time domain stuff that is supposedly not minimum phase and also distortion stuff. Right. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the the interest it was the selling convolution filters because there's one particular site which sells convolution filters for headphones i've seen expensive that. ones i've seen that yeah. and a lot of people buy them and i mean that's an interesting one where it's it's actually quite a good uh, in, insert to the discussion of is it snake oil because does it do what it says it does well it 
changes the frequency response of the headphone. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of people seem to prefer the way that it alters things. So from that perspective, no. But also it makes a lot of marketing claims about, you know, it's like it's saying, well, you know, we correct the phase and everything. It's like, well, yeah, but so does EQ. Uh, don't Why like do the I need idea. to pay $300 yeah. to do this when I can EQ it? Yeah. That's, yeah. I don't, I don't like the idea of selling stuff that is free. Like I, I'm fine yes. with it if if it's if it's like if somebody builds an amp, right? Or 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 or, or actually no, the RME ADI2 DAC, right? Like that's a great product because it has EQ built into it. And even though yes, I use all my EQ on a computer and software, and for me that's kind of a pointless device. There's so many people who don't, and having a device like yeah. that makes sense because you can just make those adjustments on your physical device. And I think the same would be true for an amplifier where you had the twiddly bits to affect the frequency response in the way that makes sense for how you would want to do it. Um, but the idea of like selling EQ, I mean, there's, uh, there's also other issues with that, which is that's my, something that you should be di dialing in personally above a certain frequency anyway. Yeah. Well, the, interestingly, his convolution filters do stop at about seven. Oh, so okay. it does, yeah, it avoids kind of most of the issues out there, which is good because a lot of people, you know, do even just with auto. EQ, I would say it should free. be a, quite a bit lower than that. <laughs> but like, for I would example, agree. this, this, yeah. Cause this, uh, well, just an example for me, there are peaks that show up on this that don't show up in the measurements. And I'd only be able to find that if I'm doing like personal sweeps like well yeah i mean it, it depends on the headphones right like if you had like an iem and you're ignoring the hptf stuff then you would, could be pretty confident out to 7k <clears throat> not for your boys okay. length modes <laughs> sabaton okay, uh, okay 6k 6k <laughs> two messages from sabaton one it has a convolution no well it, it can load convolution filters for room correction or whatever else you want to do it doesn't give you stuff itself is hq player snake oil uh so you should watch the video that i've got coming out next week which is uh just about the sort of topic of do dac sound different and on the topic yeah, of i still ABX want to look stuff. at your data and test process for that though yeah i mean it's still the same as what we discussed previously um basically the problem with abxing stuff and the reason why i don't typically include you know the fact that I've ABXed it in a video is both because A, as explained earlier, it's not actually a way of determining whether a particular characteristic that you hear or think you're hearing is real or not. All it is is a test of whether you can differentiate in any way between two devices. Um, but also a lot of people will just go, I don't believe you, you faked it, you've lied, whatever. Uh, so this Unless video- Unless they're in the room with you, you know, administering the control. <laughs> I mean, with the ASR one, I literally invited the guy yeah. around, uh, but yeah. Um, so basically, to answer or try start to answer the question of do DAC sound different, I'm starting with something which people can participate with, and that can be uh, more easily both remotely verified and also that you guys can yeah, join in with, which is the reconstruction filter or the upsampling. DACs have different reconstruction filters. That's a marketing point for certain higher end DACs, like Cord, for instance. Um, and basically, the first video is going to be on whether or not that is uh, audible and whether you can ABX between that, even though everything under 20 kilohertz is the same. So that should be, I'm sure it's going to generate some spice, but also hopefully we'll get plenty of people joining in and participating with it. So it should be good. Fun. Um, should we move on to topic number four? Sure. What was number four again? Are discussions or uh, judgments regarding technicalities more helpful or more harmful to the audio discourse? And then, wait. This is just this is just your pet topic again. No, no. So we doesn't even have anything to do with no, no, amps. No, it doesn't. But but people. Well, it does. It does. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is actually specifically because we have Cameron on stream. Uh, because we've okay. talked about this before, um, and so for example, we've talked about how people will often regard if they see a graph. I think the default perspective that people have on seeing the graph is that this just describes tonality and that there's a separate sort of secret uh very real judgment uh or very real acoustic property that people are judging to be good or bad in terms of technicalities but i wanted to relate this to cameron and also to amps and dax specifically because this is another area where there are seemingly you know i mean you've you, you've kind of gone over it where it's you've said that you know um, if there is an audible difference, there'd be a measurable difference. Yeah. And even in situations where we would say, okay, this is below the audible threshold, right? These are, let's say, you know, 
equally audibly transparent, even though there are measurable differences, um, people are still attributing technicalities to them. And the question is, should is this more helpful or more harmful, this kind of dis using language like technicalities as separate from just identifying, okay, this particular distortion profile versus that particular distortion profile, right? Um, and where should, the, where should the discourse go there, uh, in your opinion? I, I think it's a bit of a tricky one because with both source gear and with headphones, I don't think it's something that we should just not talk about because it is important. Like with headphones, there are headphones which are widely agreed upon by general community consensus obviously there's uh, some which are more or less argued about as to regardless of what the tuning is whether they are more or less detailed or more or less technical or more or less slammy or whatever and they all have measurable differences it's not that they're the same it's just that we don't necessarily have a way to interpret the more nuanced aspects of the frequency response and stuff to look at a graph and immediately go that is going to be more detailed mm -hmm. there's certain things we know like you know if it's got if it's brighter a lot of people are going to perceive it as more detailed um doesn't necessarily mean that it is going to be the same way for everyone but that that's a fact um with source gear stuff i've got to be honest detail retrieval itself is something of a bit of a solved issue like i don't like the topping stuff much but it's just as detailed as a lot of the really really the high-end stuff that people rave about for me i i don't find that detail is really a problem nowadays i find that it's the other stuff that gets messed with uh like sound stage is one which for me is the sort of biggest impact with a dac um and there are a lot of reasons as to why dac specifically could alter that whereas uh an amp might not just because of the time domain uh, affecting aspects that DAX handle that amps don't but yeah t I mean I don't think it's something which people should ignore it's also something which is a bit of an iffy conversation just because you we don't have evidence to prove or disprove it even going back to the reconstruction filter thing like that there isn't study on at what point is a reconstruction filter audibly transparent or not um, we don't have an answer to that lots of companies will claim that a better reconstruction filter makes something uh, better in X, Y, and Z ways, and other people will say, no, it makes no difference, I can't hear a difference, or and some people say, I can hear it. all of the time domain information. Here's yeah. every attack. <laughs> and a lot of people will say, well, you know, screw that, I like Nostax. So it's, it's... I don't think it's something which we should ignore, because it is something which there seems to be, both with headphones and with source gear, a reasonable amount of community consensus over on specific products whether that is founded in the actual performance of the product or influenced by other factors like price people are going to perceive something more expensive as better generally speaking just because of expectation bias i don't know i think it's something that should still be discussed just with a uh, metric truckload of salts I, well. I mean i think that as long as people keep the words i perceive yes just yeah. in everything then it's rather than this I mean, is that or this you know definitively yeah, like yeah i get what you're saying if you say you perceive this well then i'm generally going to trust you, you could be lying um that'd be kind of weird you could be mistaken well yeah but i mean like being mistaken about your own perception is a bit oh. epistemologically confusing well, oh but it's 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 a i know <laughs> i know i know i know i know it's fallible or whatever no. um and of so course, you know, is... there's there's the whole private language problem as well with this, too. Yes. Can we get? Can we just put? Let's see. Someone says disagree that it's a radical subjectivism that's almost denying the objective truth even exists. Well, I mean, the objective truth exists and is verifiable, comma, the objective truth of your perceptions well, okay, but, but is hold, not something that I can access without hold, some pretty invasive surgery. Hold on, though. I think I think the issue for a lot of these discussions is that people aren't thinking about uh, externalism correctly, right? They are having an experience with a DAC and an amp and a headphone and whatever, right? And they're yeah, and just they're attributing that to an external thing as opposed to their own experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, and and like that's a reasonable thing to. That's intuitive, right? Um, and they're not ag again thinking maybe there is another cause or some other cause for their experience uh, to be what it is, or it's not being scrutinized. I suppose in the same way as 
language that would in you know be, is being shoveled at them <laughs> through marketing through confirmation bias through whatever right or even the, the fact that it's a nice beautiful red chassis or something like that because um, we, we can't differentiate objectively speak well when a head when people say x headphone is more detailed than y headphone we can very easily show that at the very least their frequency responses are different uh, there is there are clear measurable differences between them how we then explain whether that translates to is it more detailed or not or is it just brighter or is there something else going on we don't really have a clear answer to that's the problem it's interpretation there are also other areas where people will say oh i got this usb cable and it made my system more detailed and you can quite demonstrably show that there is absolutely no difference in any shape way or form and at that point you have to go maybe what you're hearing isn't real so problem comes back to the ab because uh brandon i think it was in the chat asking well, why don't you just abx the problem is that you can use that to show when there may uh, with, like, with cables you can you can't use it to demonstrably prove a negative but at least showing that you know you can't pass the abx test with the cables is a good indication that maybe there isn't a difference you will very easily be able to pass an abx between two headphones but it doesn't mean that your perception of it being more detailed is true it could just be that you expect that to be more detailed but the fact that it's got a completely different frequency response means you can identify it and therefore your expectation is still causing you to perceive things differently when something is differentiable uh it's it doesn't an abx test doesn't solve the issue of uh, identifying individual characteristics and their yeah. legitimacy I, this is what i noted a long time ago as well that like i mean it, when you're talking about abx you're talking about two things what if you increase the number of things um and and you know like the ability to differentiate isn't necessarily the ability to it, it isn't necessarily an indication of this does that in this way right yeah. um it's just the ability to differentiate which is a very we interesting a concept in epistemologically uh, but we can that's a separate thing <laughs> um exactly, exactly seven. seven just to quickly answer that it's because with cables generally speaking there is literally no measurable difference Whereas with Dax and Amps, well, you can very this is what this is what I'm talking about. People read the headline, which is a yeah. is a reasonable headline, right? Like, but they're they miss the, I mean, the, the 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 facts, right? With with Dax and Amps, you can show very clear measurable differences. You can have the debate about whether those are audible and what subjective effects that translates to, but you can at the very least show very clear demonstrable measurable differences. With cables, generally that is not the case you cannot in most cases show clear differences between cables but there are cases where you can there are cases where you can and there are cases where you can very easily hear a difference but it's just not typically the ones exactly that you know, talking yeah. about in terms of putting a new cable on your lcd5 or whatever exactly okay so let's let's just talk about thresholds again though because if you think about it go going let's flip my argument about cable capacitance on its head all cables by their nature are a low pass filter right? Because the cable has a parallel capacitance and you have a series resistance. And all low pass filters introduce phase shift. So the question is, where do we stop caring? Is it a degree at 20 kilohertz? Is it 0.1 degrees at 20 kilohertz? Is it 0 0.0001 degrees? Because technically there will be there there at some threshold if you care enough. Right um so and that's true also of distortion right like a headphone cable is a well it has a real impedance i guess real impedance is an oxymoron it has a resistance and that resistance is temperature variable like all conductors and that means that when you connect it to a source that has a real impedance and to a headphone that has a real impedance then you are going to have distortions across it the question is how much do we care about? Well, and, and this is this goes back to the whole thing about confidence, <laughs> right? Because people are making purchase decisions not around necessarily whether or not they'll hear something with music in a actual, you know, controlled situation. Rather, they're trying to uh like I don't know what uh, over uh index for things like this so that they can be certain they never will if that makes sense, right? So they're scoring very heavily for things that might be beyond the threshold of audibility, but it doesn't matter that it's beyond the threshold of audibility. It's part of that confidence. Um, and I think to some degree that's 
actually okay. I like, do too. Buying... I don't think that that's bad. Like you shouldn't. I'm not going to tell people buy the lower performing amplifier. <laughs> you know, like that doesn't make sense to me. But I like, usually yeah. am because it means that it's probably like if not it's cheaper, always, sure. but a if lot cheaper... of cases it's going to be yeah. like stabler. Oh, stabler, sure. There can be other reasons too, but like, um, I don't actually have a problem with that as a concept. You know, to be to make your purchase decisions around where your confidence thresholds are because i don't think that like there's there's a the question of, of thresholds of audibility and that in my mind is solved by one it, one person like we don't need a massive sample size all we need is one person to be able to tell in an abx right um, yeah, and, whether and, something is meaningful for most people is a very is, different question to exactly. can anyone can hear anyone this? and i think that's really all that really counts for this because then we're dealing with like, as this relates to the public, it's, oh, that person could tell a difference, therefore I care, even if I can't. Um, and uh, and so it's, it's yeah, it's it all, all goes back to confidence in my mind. <clears throat> uh, Sabaton's got two questions. First one, why can't an HM1 or a Holobliss not be built for $200? Blaine seems to think it can be. I don't think Blaine has said that. Uh, I, mean, I mean, I think I don't know about the Bliss. I don't actually know how it's built. I know what the bill of materials cost on the Bliss is, and the the their margins are a lot lower than other companies. So that one, you definitely, I mean, you can argue about whether it makes sense to build it in the way that. Well, they have the question it. here is: Are we talking about a one-to-one -one replication or something that has the same signal effects? Yes, exactly. I'm sure you know you can you can build an amplifier, which and this is where it's going to get into sort of subjective that you feel sounds the same as a Bliss or an HM1 for whatever price you like. You the the parts cost of both of those amps is just demonstrably. Oh yeah, no object. So, I think that uh, you could make something that replicates the behavior of the amplifier, like the non effects parts of the amplifier of the HM1 for two hundred. Yeah. Yeah, because the HM1's but, amp is more simple in design. Yeah. I mean the, now, Bliss, the Bliss is actually really complicated. Yeah, but, no, like that's just a high BOM thing. Yeah, and inherently, it, his other well statement, not really question, was, but you know, not everything is captured in measurements. That's not true. Uh, that there's absolutely no reason why anything that we can hear could not be captured through. I have a take measurement. on this. Okay, I think that people who say not everything is captured in measurements would also say not everything is captured in a photo, and that's true, right? A photo is a perspective. It gives you one view of something. However, if you take enough photos of something, you can see all of the parts of something. I think you this give too much measurements. I think you give too much credit to the people who are saying that everything is captured by measurements. There's a scenario where that's true. Courtesy is important. Yes, there's a scenario where that's true. But I also think there's a scenario, or, or there are people who think that all this measurement mumbo jumbo is bunk, and that it doesn't. It's like there's. There's nothing there, well, basically. I mean, th that that position is basically anti-realism, right? Like, yes, that's just saying. There's a the, lot of the that. physical universe. Have you spent any exist. time on Head Five? <laughs> well, yes, I, like, I know I, it exists. I mean, I've said before, I have niche. some, uh, you know, concerns about our ability to interpret certain things from the measurements. But in terms of what you can capture in the measurements, I, I think anyone who's saying that is not aware of well, how immensely, like. That analyzer, the fact that you can get that that kind of performance for that price, even though it's ridiculously expensive, is actually kind of mind-boggling. Like the fact that we can measure things down to almost Johnson noise level is and below ridiculous. The FFTs. Yeah, is that's in, like just for those watching that don't know, that is the amount of noise that is basically produced by the fact that the atoms are at room temperature. Well, like, whatever temperature it's, there, but it's it's the motion of the yeah. atoms in the conductors. It's so in terms of uh, being able to measure stuff, that bit's sorted. We've we've got that handled. But in terms of whether we can answer exactly how something is going to sound just from the measurements, in not in all cases yet. No. There's your there's your favorite. But that has described you as an objectivist, and now you are no longer useful to us as a third panelist. <laughs> You are going to be terminated from headphones.com immediately. Yeah. Damn. Sorry. Okay. We can't have we can't have everybody be an objectivist. Uh, right, it's your, so it's your favorite worry. word. I'm sure this this video is gonna get posted <laughs> no, but, to ASR pretty but, quick. But the, here's here's the, the one thing next week. Though oh that the one you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course that's gonna be yeah. Posted. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. But to get to the crux of that uh, subject where someone's saying, you know, measurements don't capture everything, it is actually related to the question of technicalities 
that I mentioned that I brought up earlier, where um, our sort of collective discourse as a community has trended in this direction, where and, and I'm trying to get us to move away from this because I think it 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 creates these sort of um, erroneous uh, thought processes about the measurements that do exist, where people won't bother to look one step further at the measurement. You say, for example, a frequency response measurement of a headphone, and consider that this is the representation of that how that headphone behaves at the eardrum of one individual head, right? Like they won't they won't go that one little step further. They think this is what that thing is supposed to be, you know, the truth of in all conditions, and then think, okay, well. That doesn't perfectly describe my experience. So there's something else and therefore measurements don't capture everything. Um, and I, I worry that this, this discussions around technicalities, even though I've used it in the past, we've Cameron, you and I have both used it because I, there is a there's a parsimony to, to describing things in this way. Uh, it, I, I actually do believe that it is more harmful than it is helpful because it it pushes people away from th going that next step that they need to go to you know have a better understanding of the measurements and how it relates to their experience the other side of this i just wanted to raise this because i do think it's interesting as well is that if people weren't talking about these sort of experiential qualities and making judgments about them beyond the what's measured we wouldn't have been able to figure out for example the whole dd base versus ba base thing that's a pretty obvious one that can be demonstrated and shown you know um, when using a, a five and two eight, yeah. Um, and in cases, not yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in cases, yeah. Um, and there's bound to be other examples of that where basically those people who are talking in terms of technicalities or whatever subjective properties they want to ascribe, you know, goodness and badness to, you know, a headphone, um, they're not satisfied with the existing paradigms and analysis of headphone measurements. And I think it's totally reasonable to not be satisfied with the existing paradigms. Of analysis. Well, I don't think any of us are satisfied. I don't think we are That's either. The whole yeah. reason we're working to progress it. Exactly. But exactly. the exactly. problem is that people are not satisfied with it and then decry it as evil and incorrect rather yes. than going, how can we fix it and yes. move it forward? Exactly. Exactly. And also that people tend to extend that into things like measurements of electronics, where we have a much more mature understanding. Yeah. 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 Because I, I think our, our understanding of, well, the measurement of electronics is, as you say, considerably further along with headphones I, I don't know if it's accurate to say it's probably not best to say that you know there's stuff that's not captured but just the fact that we don't know you know how a particular well, headphone is going to perform and, on your head and technically speaking it's not captured, that isn't captured but, like you the no. response at your eardrum isn't captured right um but that doesn't mean that it's you know oh something beyond frequency response for example um yeah exactly i, I think that's the thing like the technicality like the technicalities discussion to bring it back to that that is captured in the frequency response it's just that a not all the time is is uh, the frequency response shown with sufficiently fine-grained information to have the chance of interpreting that but also we don't have the understanding to interpret that purely from the graph as time progresses and as we have more data to go on more feedback to correlate it to hopefully that's something which will change and even if it's just based on a machine learning model or something we might be able to uh, progress that in future but not if people just steer away from using any kind of objective information whatsoever. I mean, that, that that's kind of a lot, lot of the point of uh, my talk from CanGem is just because they're not perfect right now, it doesn't mean that they're not going to get better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like um, Danger Zone asking, how do you capture soundstage? Well, we don't have an individual metric for soundstage. Yeah, but we but could. You can look we at could. So, well, we could in future, and we can currently look at certain th aspects of frequency response. There's the you know two K dip in d source gear, jitter, and crosstalk. Those two factors are are you know are two sorry those are two factors of what we perceive as soundstage. We don't currently know how to exactly give an answer as to which of two things is going to stage bigger, but we've got some pretty good answers well, as to how I, to get a likely answer to it. I can I I don't know about you guys, but I feel fairly confident about you know being able to predict certain subjective qualities from a frequency response graph. Like I can predict yeah. like timbre done soundstage. I mean, these are all likelihoods, right? They're not perfect, but soundstage is one that's pretty easy to predict. Um, yeah. Soundstage. Definitely. Yeah. In, in IEMs. I mean that, that the whole DD base thing, right? Like, like I mentioned, um, 
yeah, I, I, there are things that I think are pre- more predictable now than they were ha- would have been if we had if we had just sort of thrown up our hands and said, well, that's just how me- how things measure, and not bothered to continue to investigate, right? Um, but um, I think this is there. It's now time for spicy hour. So let's let's land all the let's let's get all the spicy questions uh, in, the ch- in the chat. I uh, I did want to lead with one if you guys would indulge me. Um, just jumping off from that most recent discussion, uh, there is a sense in which technicalities is all just acoustic impedance. Because, well, I shouldn't say just acoustic impedance. Supposing you had a headphone that was extremely consistent and performed the same across all different heads, you would have a better oh, understanding. What's that? I thought we were talking about amps. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know. But we're now into spicy <laughs> hours, so... Uh, supposing you had a headphone that had, you know, like was extremely consistent across different heads, um, low acoustic impedance, I feel you would have a more clear understanding of technicalities for anybody who used that headphone. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Okay, I would I would want to think more th- like thoroughly about how that experiment would look. I'm not saying I, I believe this. I'm just saying I. Yeah, I'm. I'm just saying this is a. This has been on my mind lately. A priori, I'm not sure that it would be that way. Okay. Why? Well, because like, if you have a lower acoustic impedance, then you're interacting less with the canal load. Yes. Like that's sort of one of the things that Constantine and I talk about this occasionally, and we're getting completely off topic for this stream. But if you have an ultra low Z source, then the individual source impedance of the canal. Well, that's sort of loading piece of the canal is going to be not reflected in the response at the eardrum. So there's kind of a, there's a scenario where that could produce greater variation in perception. It gets confusing. Hmm. But anyway, for a spicy hour, if you guys have spicy questions to ask, uh, well, I, I have a spicy take from someone in chat. Oh, uh, Ataman says that he thinks that I need to be harsher with you to burst your bubble. My bubble? What's your what's bubble. what's the bubble? I think that's the bubble of subjectophilia. Oh dear. Yeah. So uh, apparently, I need to crank up the harshness there. Okay. I, uh, Cameron, I think that probably the positive results that you've found are going to ultimately be demonstrably due to some sort of methodological issue i mean I, i've shared everything with you and if you can point out any methodological issues i would very much appreciate if you could do so before the video is released before the video as soon is as, soon as you said that I... his camera started to pixelate so this is just like the uh <laughs> So the headphone illuminati no, but... at work again, you know. Scared the bandwidth away. <laughs> the, the main thing is I can't see all the variables in play. One of the things that I get particularly, like as we get towards positive results on things that I think should not have meaningful results, I'm like, okay, where did something go wrong, right? You know, is it there's something that's misbehaving at the output are we continuously monitoring the outputs during the listening test is it that there's you know some like where where is this thing coming from is there something that is not being controlled for that could be the source of it and a lot of those i think you got pretty well covered i don't know if you're going to be doing like a continuous recording of the outputs during the listening tests and then just cross correlating them with a source file that might be useful. Um, I probably can do if I'm using the HM1, I guess. Yeah, because shit goes wrong. Like, that's the big problem with all this, particularly when you get into the point where you are clearly a quite able listener, um, which unfortunately means that the threshold for a problem that you can detect becomes much lower. Mm, I'll be honest. That's a good point. I don't expect that we're going to find when everything is like in a scenario where you find an audible difference between reconstruction filters that are not producing significant passband phase shift or significant aliasing with typical content that is going through them. Um, I don't think that there is, I would say that if you found a positive result there, I would expect it to be something 
going weird. And that something going weird could literally be some DACs are not responding correctly to out of band content, you know? And mm. that would be something which would not be a result of you're wrong. It would be a result of these devices are yeah, not was just another thing as we thought they were. I am using but that is also different. DACs just to try and alleviate that issue. Um, I know. And it's just like, so and the problem here is we're, this is the scientific process though, right? Like you yeah. find a result that's... and then you, you try to control for things that could have created a spurious result. And that's the thing. Like, I mean, I've, I've said that the reason I sent it to you is because if there is a problem, I would like it pointed out so that I can address it. And then if it turns out that was causing the difference, then hey, we, well, we've learned something. And if it turns out that that wasn't, then well, maybe we've learned something different. Um, you know, and even if the video comes out and someone says, hey, I think it could be because of this. And then I test it and it turns out it was, you know, that's not an insult or anything. That's, that's just the scientific video. process. Stuff no, is I mean, not like... static forever. And we only learn by providing constructive criticism and input. That's and I think a really important work. thing is like getting a result and then subsequently documenting the cause of that result. One of the things that stops that from being a defeat is if you are clear about what you have documented. Like, people extrapolate a lot from their findings in these things. Yes. And I and, think and that that's that why I'm trying to be I'm... as simple in, like, that's why I'm doing it digitally, first of all, just because yeah. of the fact that then it eliminates any potential, uh, you know, difference between two DACs and whatnot. I'm trying to minimize variables as much as possible, be as thorough as I possibly can, because I, I don't would make, like for this to be claims that are massive outside of what you've actually shown. Yeah, exactly. And, the, and the, the claim of this is just going to be: it seems like it's audible. That's yeah. it. I'm not making any anything beyond that. I can provide my subjective experience of the differences. Uh, that you know could well just be that because there is something I can differentiate between. I'm then expectation biasing other things into existence, even if they're not there. All I can and, say is there is something here between these two things where, in theory, the only difference is the reconstruction filter that is audible. Yeah, and I, and I think that that's... I think that it's sort of like people treat a lot of how I engage with some... and how a lot of us engage with Sean's work as if we're attacking um, a work by saying, hey, I think that there is an alternative potential explanation for this result. But that is well, literally the process of scientific engagement. <laughs> I mean, even before I joined oh, headphones.com and stuff, and some of the uh, conversations that you and I had and stuff, and people yep. were like, "Hey, why, why are you guys fighting?" It's like we're not, we're not fighting. We're having a constructive debate. Yeah, I, I think the, 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 the spiciest dialogue we ever had was not anything to do with technical audio. It's philosophy. Uh, no, it was like <laughs> I've avoided that deliberately. No, it was there. There was there was an FBAF thread where things got heated, and I was very. Uh, I wasn't in the thread, but I was oh. very uh, critical of that. I don't recall this at all. I, I don't want to dredge it back up. I'll tell. I'll oh, DM I, it know, to you. I know what it is, and you're right. I was wrong in that situation. I think if I'm <sighs> thinking of one that you are thinking yeah. about. Yeah. So. So that, but that's like that's the only time I think we were heated before we were coworkers. But don't worry, we can still become heated. Yeah. It can, it, I mean, right. we're, we're, we're in the spice zone right now. And you guys' spicy peppers here are not very good, I got to admit. Like, come on, you can well, do Danger better. Well, Danger Zone is trolling. He's Earlier trolling. On, he, He's... Said that, he said that Rainbow Cable sounded more gay, which is Sab admittedly something we should bring to market. Oh, Why not? Um, Dude, Sabaton I wonder if you can have it in time for June. How is soundstage not a self-deception if there is no soundstage measurement? Or well, because not everything that we perceive, like, you know, when we perceive oh something as spicy it's not one exact number that we can point to well and uh, this is the thing soundstage, not a self soundstage is not a flavor measurement yeah like soundstage is just a all of these things in uh, their, their their descriptions of the experience that we assign like soundstage itself is not a real thing it's a it's it's an a, a, a description of some sort of part of the experience that is presumably caused by things that we can measure it's just a matter of connecting the dots Eminent one says require a UC versus blame debate. Who? Oh, um, isn't that the guy who does the? No, I don't know. I thought it was the guy who who did. Who was the guy who made your ADCs? Oh, UC is the HQ player developer. Oh. Uh... Oh. I mean, it probably won't be very interesting, but we could. Oh, oh here. This is this is listener people who the one who made the ADCs is Ivan. Ivan, okay, or Ivan, okay, okay. 
Uh, listener says people who aren't able to correlate FR to technical performance suffer from skill issue syndrome. No, I don't think that's necessarily I mean, no, that's the case. That, but that is true, though. Technically, it's well, actually, yes. collectively, we have a skill issue. It's, yes, and we're working okay. to resolve. That's true, but I think that the I think that this go this gets fixed quite easily if if those same people just start doing EQ and doing manual sweeps. So I, I do think I will say correlating subjective things to a measurable thing is not science. And I do note that people often go a bit awry on that oh one. Oh my god, they, they're pontificating about, you're hearing this! <laughs> yeah. It was like, but, um, but you're not in my head, the private language that's going on here, you know. Yeah, and it's it's like the most prime for sighted effects of anything. Yeah, yeah. Is when you're doing that. Yep. So I just, I wanted to emphasize that like the premise that because we can make a technical argument for why something could exist and then subsequently say i correlate a subjective experience i've had to a demonstrable measurable thing that does not mean that there should really be a lot of weight on that being true unless we have actually verified i that. think we could we could do it on an individual basis like a person can make that judgment if they're i mean it depends on how much you care about it being true well, I don't think right? you're ever like going to get to a point where it's going to be true for multiple, for like large groups of people. And, and this is the thing: is that like in a lot of these, with a hat or Cameron with a beard, that's just. Are you just saying that because we're all white? I'm I'm only mostly white. Oh my god, my beard was it's terrible. True. That's why I got rid of it. Um, I mean, yeah, the the problem is here that it's impossible to isolate variables. We we can't have two headphones really that are different in every single way except for one stage is bigger like it's we don't have a way really to scientifically prove these correlations there's there's too much issue with the fact that they are oh, differentiable you could if you started with but... if you started with basically isolating the descriptions you, you could basically get a group of people together who who you could confirm use these this language to indicate the same thing um if you solve but I, with I, I don't just think how can... With how interconnected the community is, how would you do that without avoiding the fact that a lot of the time, even if two people have the same experience with a product, it's in some way because of what they had read or heard or been told by someone else before. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm saying you put these people all in the same room and you basically isolate various different, uh, like you get them to, uh, you know, agree on something, let's just say. And whatever that one thing is that they agree on, you could probably figure out a way to correlate that for the for that group. Um, we have someone prophesying in the chat. What? Jeff Brig Brigsby says, Hi-Fi Man will drop Susvara to $1,799 for one hour this week. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Can, can you tell me the Powerball numbers? <laughs> Someone is asking what the ethic background is of me. If I, cables I'm truly make a difference, why do all expensive cables sound better, not worse, according to reviewers? Um, because people are biased by price. Many of these reviewers get given them for free. Uh, also, they're fancy. Well, also let's. Fancy. I mean, let's 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 be more specific. Who does this? I don't. I don't want to like name individual people, but there why are not? plenty. Of <laughs> Uh, uh, because I don't want to start dramas. Wait, no, I want to start drama with someone. (laughs) Yeah, hold on. What's his name? That's what we're here for. It's spicy hour. It's it's time to start. I mean, on the same topic, someone says, Do expensive fuses make a difference? No, next question. Um, (laughs) and just the background is bald. (laughs) That's my ethnicity. (laughs) I mean, that is your ethnicity. (laughs) Yeah, it's funny because I actually haven't. Uh, buzzed it in a while. So J- okay, Jay Ziyagi, I'll, I'll mention that one just because he did a blind test between cables, and I, I'm mentioning it just because there was some methodological issues, which I did actually mention to him beforehand. But he was in the room when stuff was being switched, which just that alone means that you have the ability to hear just the cables rustling and the sound of the connectors, yeah. the time it takes to switch yeah. between the cables, all that kind of yeah, stuff. There are so many tells. Yeah, you, you can't 
if you want to do a blind test between speaker cables, you have to have the person leave the room and not be able to hear what's going on in the room. You have to have the amount of time taken between each run be consistent. Uh, there's a lot of stuff you have to control for, which unfortunately was not controlled for in his test. And so, or have a switcher. Uh, like if, if there's a switcher just... and there's no audible cue about which cable is which, that would stay in the Also, just the fact that uh, he, I think he only did like five runs or something. Or it was either five no, or ten, but either, either way, it's not statistic. The result was not actually statistically significant. Uh, and, and the threshold for statistical significance, like people use 5%, but that's a pretty loose threshold yeah i can't remember what it was but it wasn't it wasn't five percent so i i've Oops. done the least scientific blind testing of of sources in that video i did like years ago where i blindfolded myself and had my girlfriend just unplug stuff and plug it in it was volume matched at least but it was not in any way controlled and i and I, even then i didn't get it right most of the time so Someone does keep bringing up what Mary didn't know in the chat. Excellent. Keep bringing it up. Uh, that is one of my favorite papers. So who, the guy who, asked me, can a blind person know what the experience of seeing red is if they can't see? Oh, I thought they yeah, were literally dumbass. saying. Okay, if they, yeah. No, they, they literally are. But no, I was going to say, yeah, dumbass. If they know what the experience is seeing. If they know the experience of seeing red, then they know the experience of seeing red. Boom. Tautology. How did they do not... that? Oh, if I know, but no, if, well, they, they, if they did, then they did. <laughs> they walked out of the room for a brief moment, <laughs> then walked back in. No, I mean it's it's the there. This is just the quality of. Question. Sorry, where where I don't know. I don't see who's saying this. It, th this is re recurringly Sabaton two eight eight has been asking oh. permutations of if a blind person knew every scientific fact about the color red and every fact of how the brain perceived it. Would they know everything about the color red? And this is the question whether there's an experiential element of knowledge. knowledge. And there is. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's just that's, true. Like that's... The, the, What the experience of seeing red is, is a fact about red. Now, if you knew the experience of seeing red, even if you'd never seen it, because it had been implanted in your brain somehow, then yes, you would know that. Okay, that, that's, that's, that, that, that gets into you the can't... question of intentionality, though, and the intentionality of experience. And so it's not quite as clear as saying you are actually having that experience because it's like saying, for example, when you're thinking about the moon, you're not necessarily thinking about a picture of the moon. You're thinking about the moon. And those two things I'm are... <laughs> Most or people to... are not thinking about a picture of a moon. They're thinking about the moon. Or think I'm thinking about... about the concept of the moon. Think about centaurs. No. <laughs> right? Like, you, you don't do need to... The, the point is that when we're like when we have a genuine veridical thought about something right do you um, think about the experiential elements of centaurs regularly no but like you, you could you're thinking you have a you're picturing something in your mind that has intent it's a fictional thing right it doesn't exist it's not a real thing but you're picturing something that you may have hands. seen in the past and there's an intentionality behind that um and uh so the point is more that just because just because in theory you could say somehow implant that doesn't mean necessarily that you, it would be the same experience as if you were to walk outside of the dark room or suddenly become sighted and see the color red. Well, no, it what I'm saying is the same with sound if, though. Like you can't describe to someone who has been deaf, fully deaf their whole life what a bright headphone sounds like. It doesn't mean that other people can't perceive it. It's some things, you know, it's not possible to tr directly translate the information without the experience yes. itself. But it doesn't mean that that is an invalid or impossible experience. It's, you know, it's like, experience imagine that I had the ability to induce firing in specific neurons in someone's brain. And I did that in such a way that it exactly replicated the way that it, that it would be if they had, in fact, seen the color red. That person has now had the experience of seeing the color red without seeing the color red. Jeff like Chris, exactly the same as like like you're basically yes. like like prodding them in the right way to yeah. like in exactly in every single neuron of the brain i am exactly producing the pattern of activation that yeah in that in that case yes because that's right. just that's just yeah of course in that case yes yeah is the star but trek that's also teleporter trivia. killing them or is it just moving them that's what? it's doing both yeah i like to think that it moves them there then it kills them and then it makes a new one Jesus Christ. Jeff Grigsby says, beard growing contest, DMS and Golden Sound, who wins? Oh, well, definitely not me because uh, mine was terrible, which is why I got rid of it. Go watch the Munich video from a Sh couple years ago. 
Shout also, to... Bad Seeds in chat. Yeah, shout out to Bad Seeds. demolish too. anyone in a beard <laughs> contest. So. Yeah, no, Bad Seed is why I'm going to be removing my beard soon. Or you just can't compete. You just yeah. see him in person and go, oh, okay, I've just got to get rid of this then. It didn't look real when I saw him in person. It was nuts. It's glorious. Someone says, think about the Roman Empire. I'm not sure why. I'm more of a Qing China kind of a guy. Could call me a Manchurian candidate. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Simon Wenmuth says, so if it's spicy, what do you think of Rob Watt's thoughts that single core power cables could sound better because of RFI, etc.? I'm pretty dubious on the whole RF thing. There's not really any evidence. There's been a couple instances where stuff close to the audible band seemed to have made an audible difference, like on the DCS Bartok, where it's got a DSD upsampling mode and a PCM upsampling mode, where the filter response is pretty similar, but the DSD mode had a huge amount of ultrasonic noise, and that did seem to have an effect. But I think that's, if anything, it could just be causing an issue with the, like, that could just cause the amp to behave different. I didn't check that, so... Um, low level rf on the power supply itself i can't really see how that could make a difference i'm sure blaine will just say an outright no <laughs> well i mean okay so beards do affect sound quality if the seal sorry so i think that the first question is does a solid core versus a stranded cable affect rf interference <laughs> Like I think we've we've Just gone from about a... skin effect, or like if yeah, you, no, like... it'll it'll make it a different differently behaving low pass filter, technically speaking. Yeah, at some frequency, but yeah. how does that then get into? Well, like, especially if, if you've got a power bit. supply with any filtering in it. Yeah, no, I mean like your power supply by its nature is a filter. I mean, yeah, if you don't have a low pass filter, then you don't have a DC power supply. You have. Yeah something very odd although i guess it could actually that would actually be like a fun i don't know like i guess the converse of a nelson pass amp camp kind of thing see if you can make an amp that has good enough power supply rejection that it can play music while running off of like the minimum supply capacitance so it's just bouncing up and down this sounds like it'd be good content I mean, no, it wouldn't, because nobody <laughs> wants to see a nerd talking about oscilloscope shots for 25 minutes that's fair that's the we problem. Need more spice. Give us more spice. Yeah, no, I mean, people, let's see. All right, has, a really old cop says there hasn't been a truly exciting new open back headphone released in years. Yeah, but there is one that's coming out in the next, oh, I'm not, I can't, I can't spoil it. Is that the Sennheiser HD 900? <laughs> Sadly, no. <laughs> in the next couple of months, there's going to be something coming out that I'm personally excited about. Well, I was kind of excited about the Empyrean 2. I like it. the Empyrean 2. Did did you guys get a chance, or uh, you or DMS get a chance to try the one at uh, CanJam and see if there was any difference between the two units? I did. We we didn't try both. Okay. Um, I only tried the one at CanJam. I found yeah. it a tiny bit harsh in the treble, but I liked it generally. Yeah, it's it's V shaped. It's good. I yeah. It's one that I would be, as I said in the review, it's one I'd be very comfortable owning and just having it be my f final end headphone. Because it's mechanically well built, or well designed, right? Uh, it's ergonomic, very ergonomic. Um, the materials are great, um, and it's got low distortion, and I don't have to do tons of EQ to it. So, what more could, what what more could a you know someone like me want? I mean, yeah, like the composer is nice. I guess it needs EQ, but it's not terrible. I don't know. Like the thing is, we're all so jaded that we can't feel joy about new audio. No, man, anymore. I, I, I am legitimately I excited about the thing that's coming out soon because to me, it's like the most obvious uh, step up from the HD six fifty series and six hundred series. I can't talk Wait. about it yet. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm interested now. Yeah. I'm not sure based on the FR you've shown me that that. It, I wouldn't. Seems I, I wouldn't say that it's it. it it is exactly what I want. It's not exactly what people want as the upgrade path, but it is close to that. Um, 
like the one thing for me is like the shifted ear gain is it, it should be a little lower down but i'm not gonna say any more about it but yeah I'm excited. If you live says, who's going to Canterbury, London? I'll be there. Are you guys going to Dallas or Chicago? We don't know yet. Okay. But yeah, uh, I haven't actually had an occasion to buy any new headphones in a very long time. In part because I spend my whole day reviewing headphones that come through. So I wouldn't use any headphones that I personally owned anyways. So it's difficult for me to be like, ooh, I'm excited about this thing to potentially buy. Because I don't end up buying them usually but yeah the one that's coming out soon is one of the f one that i might consider actually buying that's why i'm excited for it i'm very curious about that chef yeah, steve says not enough uh electrostatic headphone reviews i agree there's also just not enough electrostatic headphones and not enough affordable well, it, electrostatic source gear that's the issue so it is a bit uh there's the barrier to entry for electrostatic is annoying um so that's why and yeah like there's not really that many affordable other than really sort of vintage stuff there's not many affordable electrostatic headphones so not many companies want to make ele affordable electrostatic energizers and then because there's no affordable electrostatic energizers no one wants to make affordable electrostatic headphones yeah. so it's a chicken and egg thing i was really I, I was really hoping that the topping uh was it e50 uh was going to change that unfortunately it didn't catch on but um how expensive was that again it wasn't that much the main issue was apparently there were some safety concerns uh with it i don't know how severe those were but apparently that was the main thing that kind of killed it on arrival i mean I you mean, can get uh... with... sorry go ahead well the main annoyance with all energizers is like i mean people make a big deal out of the safety concerns and i do think it's usually overblown because like we're talking about at most a milliamp at voltages that are not high really um but you know whatever but it's annoying to have to make a product that has to have internal voltages of up to 500 volts or higher right like that's that requires <laughs> some care and design and it means that you have to like in some places it means you have to submit it for different kinds of certification it's just a pain in the ass that's why we probably won't make one. Like, it, from a cost perspective, it wouldn't be hard. It's just like, is the market worth the pain? Um, TJ Cook says, I know what Resolve is talking about. No, you don't. <laughs> I know what Resolve is talking about. Yeah, you about. do. You know. Okay. Uh, Grumpy Kitten says, the composer. I will tell someone what Resolve is talking about for an undisclosed sum. I'll, that, I'll make an eBay post. Don't, you can't break NDA. I don't have an NDA. Oh, damn it. Okay, well, <laughs> you shouldn't break for NDA. Uh, Gr Grumpy Kitten says the composer is an MDR MV1 with foam in front of the driver. You know what's interesting is I did find there to be a similarity between those two. Like a like um, from the, uh, like if you, Cameron, if you take the pad off the composer, the mm -hmm. inside, like the baffle design does resemble quite strongly the MV1s. I To the point okay. where I was even considering, could I swap the pads over? you can't they don't fit sadly um but yeah i had i had that thought as well uh, that the composer could be that there's there, there could be a similarity there. i mean i don't think that that's i don't think they're like aping the mv1 because i think they came out around the same time actually um but uh the design itself is very similar yeah is the ten thousand dollar clock on the DCS Lena a ripoff when DAX like the Sprengel may completely eliminate jitter jitters for ugh, for a far smaller price? Uh, it did make it sound different when I tried it. I've not tested it further to see what is actually changing or whether that's uh, DSP or improvement in jitter. I mean, I got to say, DCS is one of the few companies that actually does external clocks correctly. 10 megahertz clocks make absolutely no sense because you have to use what's called a fractional PLL, which is inherently not going to be perfect. Uh, and every single device I've tested with a 10 megahertz clock has performed worse. Uh, whereas they use actual audio rate clocks. They're essentially the same rate as the ones that are normally in your DAC, just in theory, higher quality. So they are one of the few that should, in theory, be able to make an improvement. Uh, there isn't also much reason why you shouldn't just have good clocking internally. And... Uh, yeah, a lot of DACs, even at much lower prices nowadays, have practically perfect jitter performance. So, uh, 
not sure is the answer. I would need to test it further. Stacks L300 with EQ and cheap topping energizer will beat similar priced setups. Is that is that a spicy take? I don't know. Because they have low they have low distortion, right? You can have all kinds of fun with EQ. Not sure. Okay. Blaine. E-stats can stunt facial hair growth. What? <laughs> what? You're not supposed to lick them. TJ Cook, I'll be very surprised if you know which ones I'm talking about. Um, the TJ's mimic, by the way. Yeah. If he's a dealer, he might. I'm not sure. I mean, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, actually, a dealer might know. Um, I was going to say, for, for me these days, what makes a headphone good for personal enjoyment is often more so the ergonomics and like, like if something like I was actually just uh, evaluating, I'm not sure if I can talk about this, but there was an over ear headphone from Dunu that was at the can jam show. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if it's final version. I don't think it is, but um, uh, what I found is if there are issues in the treble, which is, was what I found with that one. Uh, I'll end up finding it mean, like much more annoying to EQ. And so for me, like a, a mark of goodness about a headphone is if I don't need to mess with it too much. If, I, if all I need to do is add a bass shelf and it's comfortable, that's better than if something is, you know, uh, all kinds of peaks and dips and issues in the treble that I have to get it out the, the scalpel for, you know. So... It's weird, weirdly, like that's the kind of, I guess it's not weirdly, but like that's the kind of stuff that I'm scoring for comfort and ease of, of adjustment. Um, I suppose if I were, yeah, I was going to point to that one. So like, I suppose if I were going to be judging headphones based on some of the parameters that I think we should be evaluating, like we should, I don't know how to phrase this, based on like, if everybody's approaching headphone enjoyment the way I do, we should definitely be doing things like consistency across different heads, for example, or things like, you know, um, the, yeah, uh, HPTF effects and whatnot. Um, and uh, actually, that's something where I actually think the E3 is quite a good headphone. Like, I'd say it's probably the the close back to beat. I don't know. Blaine, what was your thoughts on the E3 when you heard it? Oh, I didn't like it. It was it too much peaks in the treble. The treble was kind of meh. The bear, there was too much bass. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. Fairly occlusion. -y. Occlusion. -y. Okay. Yeah. So for what I was going to say, the the thing with the E3 that I think. Sean liked it. Yeah. Sean liked it. Cause it's, it's Harmon like, um, this one sadly is not, is not a golden sample. This one is, uh, a bit, well, it's, it's on the shouty side. It does not measure as well as it probably ideally should. Um, and that is also in the idealized position, you know, where it's like, you know, kind of moved in a somewhat unrealistic spot. Um, but uh, overall, it measures well, I would say. Um, but what, what I think can be dramatically improved with this is the uh, consistency across heads. It's quite different uh, on the different measurement rigs, and it's very different on my head as well. And so I think, you know, that's something where, and positionally different too. Um, whereas if you can contrast that with, I know it's a closed back headphone, right? So like maybe there are, are conditions for goodness are different, but like if you contrast that with something like an, H, like an HD800S, um, there is a goodness about the HD800S that does not apply to headphones that have, you know, really thick pads that are influential or other related effects um so anyways that's what i personally am looking for in headphones it's weird that you guys found it too bassy i didn't find it too bassy at all um i find i found there to be some treble peaks that i didn't like that i kind of notched out like there's one at 7k that just doesn't show up on the graph um but i did not find it to be too bassy i mean i didn't find the treble to sound natural um but that's not uncommon to be frank yeah 
But no, my biggest complaint was that I felt that overall it had too much bass and there was, I mean, maybe it was the treble in the mids. There was something about its timbre that I just didn't quite like. Uh, the, it's quite a bit above, uh, well, it's, it's ear gainy, let's just say. <laughs> and the I don't mids... mind that as a general, like I liked the fucking composer. That's ear Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. This is actually more ear gainy though. This, this unit. Yeah. And if you heard this unit, then, you know. Um, I heard but the one that we had at Can Jam, which I think was this. Well, one. I heard well, I actually we had three at Can Jam. Yeah, it could have been this one. This was one of the ones that was at Can Jam. Uh, but this one, I I actually I it's a little shouty. It's not nearly as shouty as the as the other like the. Well, I'm blanking on the names. The higher end ones that they have. Expanse and uh, Stealth. So I think it's it's definitely better than those. Um. But uh, yeah, it's it's like you know, if if I could have a platform, a headphone platform that was like very consistent across different people, low distortion, comfortable, you know, and easy to adjust, easy to EQ, I think that would be kind of the the dream. So an HD eight hundred. <laughs> I said low distortion and easy to adjust. Low. I mean, it's not high distortion. How low does it have to be? A little lower. <laughs> um, it, it's the, the the base is poopy, and it has a six K peak that I don't like. Um, Someone in chat asks, "What are fuses, and why do swapping them don't do matter?" Uh, good, the good answer phrasing. is a... why well, use many word when few word do trick. When he no, president, I like that see. there. I like that there were actually um, more words used in that than were necessary, but just said in that true. way. <laughs> so. Uh, Zelos, a fuse is a electrical component which, when a sufficient amount of current goes through it, stops conducting. You uh, are familiar with resettable ones in the context of circuit breakers and stuff, but in this case we're basically just talking about a little wire that will burn out if too much power goes through it. And yes, it's technically current, but current times voltage is power. It's something that stops, for example, a broken electronic device from burning down your house by being just a dead short that, you know allows it to overheat something or alternatively that protects your amplifier or what have you from say a massive over voltage from a lightning strike there's no As reason to replace them for sound no there is nothing really at all like even just from a filtering perspective given as that seems to be what most of them mark themselves off the amount of filtering that you it's physically possible to do in that kind of space with the voltages and stuff we're talking about is almost nothing so, uh, no, please do not spend or waste money on expensive fuses. Give us some more spicy questions. Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll do a few more here. I know we've been going for three hours, but we need a couple more. 240 people. Blaine, Blaine, can go, Blaine can go for days. Uh, I do eventually need to eat, though. McFly, actually, I did answer this one in chat, but he said, I know you, uh, you buy songs slash albums you like. Have you noticed better sound quality with local files? I have local files which have a bit more resolution and bass texture compared to streaming. Uh, no, I buy stuff because it supports the artists. I just have a personal rule that if I listen to a song more than 10 times, I buy that album. Um, if your players <laughs> what if, are what if playing bits... What if the song is good, but everything else is terrible on that album? <laughs> uh, then I might just buy the song, but usually I'll buy the whole album. Okay. <laughs> but as long as both your streaming service and your local file player are playing bit perfect, meaning the exact same information is being played to your DAC, uh, there will be no difference. Exactly the same data is being transferred. And USB in particular does not have any impact on jitter, despite what some companies might claim. So here's a good one from Matt uh, Borchert. I think I'm saying that right. What's a piece of equipment you were sure would be snake oil, but was actually good? Um, those, uh, the isoacoustics guys the speaker isolation feet oh yeah because they just like keep it from going brrr. yeah yes that's the, the, i don't i think the, the, they, the, they the, use the, some more fluffy language in their marketing no but, but that's that, good that should different. be in the marketing language the non-tuning fork effect detuning forking speakers <laughs> the d yeah um, um yeah that i i was pretty skeptical of uh but they actually made a noticeable improvement yeah. and i've got a video coming on that which uh, I can't finish just yet because my vibrator's not arrived, which is going to be an interesting discussion with my accountant explaining why a vibrator is a legitimate business expense, but that'll be a thing. Um, 
but yeah, that was my uh, my one. Fun. Uh, Jesus Christ. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, All right. What about you, Blaine? Uh, a snake oil. I mean, like it's still snake oil, but Audio Quest Arts DA cables are actually surprisingly nice. Like they have really clampy RCA plugs on them, which don't fall out easily, which I like. A lot of cheap mm. RCA cables come out real easy. They're still total snake oil though. Okay. So it's like it's it's a it's but like if when we have them for free, I'm like sick. I like these cables. (laughs) When when someone's like, should I buy that? I'm like, never give these people money. Yeah. Um. So I'm for me the answer is going to be this uh, this listen more cable. Actually, I'm going to show the listen more cable because you know cables are snake oil and all, but uh, this is this one's blue, and it's and I like it. Okay, no, I should have a better answer. Um, a thing that uh, hmm, that I thought would be snake oil that turned out to be good. Hmm. <laughs> Stream just turned into hmm. Yeah, no, I I legitimately like I'm racking my brain here. I can't think of anything that I thought would be snake oil that was legitimately good. I can think of lots of things that well, I thought I mean, were good that turned out to be snake oil, <laughs> like or that I would have assumed would be good that turned out to be, you know, nonsense. Um, yeah, I mean, like I haven't had the experience of being like this isn't going to do anything, and then they did something. And I was like, wow. Hmm. I'm trying to think if there's like a tube amp where I had bought like some shielding for it or something, and it improved the uh, the, the, the 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 noise. Still embittered about two amps because I kept getting burned by the ones that can jam. <laughs> While you were setting them up. Well, no, because you have to reach or because we were having to. Re- you you didn't work the table, so you don't know this. But we kept I did having work to the reach table. around the front. <laughs> did. I was there. When? The amount of times you almost tripped over me, you should have known. I was I was yeah, sat right at the working. front. Yeah, I was. You I were was just there. I was I was sat right at the front, at of the I was at the front of the ship sat in like just full on tiredness depression mode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> to be fair, you did get like two hours of sleep the entire time. Yeah. But no, like I keep because people for some reason can't plug in their own cables. And I get it, they don't want to damage the expensive amp. But then I end up reaching around it and having to plug and unplug things. And when you're having to reach around an amp with exposed tubes, then you end up with arm burns. Always gotta watch out for the reach around. Uh no Matt, uh my my snake, like oil, my snake oil, my snake oil detector is not infallible. I just don't have examples of the other way around, where I, where something turned out to be good, right? Like, um, I'm a pretty skeptical person in general. Like, I don't go into things believing, you know. But there are definitely times when I have thought that something would make a difference, but it turned out to be snake oil. Like, I, I, the one that comes to mind is like years ago. I ended up buying one of those. Um, I want to say like this was like. 2016 i ended up buying one of those uh usb decrapifiers from ifi uh to plug in because i kept hearing Please. this we call them iffy here yeah so to because uh, i kept hearing this like digital sound like noise or digital whine going on and i was like i have a dac i have an amp i don't remember what they were at the time but well, maybe it was an o2 yeah it was an o2 anyways the o2 was particularly prone to picking up usb noise yeah so well, i was like oh the DAC. Yeah, the ODAC. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was like, okay, well, uh, this this decrapifier says that it's good for solving this issue. So I bought one, and I thought, oh, okay, this is probably gonna uh, fix it. It turns out that the issue was actually the USB cable. Uh, was yep. and I'd, all I had to do was swap out the USB cable, and it would have solved my problem. It was a broken USB cable. Um. So on that- uh. I was going to say, on that topic, Sabaton said, is it better to use a streamer or just connect your DAC directly to your computer? Um, Kind of depends. Some DACs are pretty susceptible to source noise. Some are effectively immune. And if you've got, like, a small laptop or something, it probably don't worry about it. If you've got a big, beefy gaming PC, it's probably more of an issue. Uh, So it can be a benefit. Don't go spending tons of money on it, though. Especially given as the jitter aspect is kind of solved for the most part nowadays. This is a good one. Snake oil tier list. We should do this. Oh, I think me and Blaine well, the have got something in the works for that. The zenith. Okay. Do, do you guys know that one? That's that's my favorite Machina Dynamica page. That's where you pay him like 
Oh, is this the remote you know, like uh yeah, and he, get, and he calls you. Yes. Yeah, and then your and then your system sounds better. I <laughs> that one I Yeah, you give him your coordinates and I, he remotely adjusts the like quantum field around yeah. your house. I'm uh if I'm only sure. he could use his powers for good. I'm pretty sure uh Alan has some good uh Wait, what was that website, Blaine, that you found that has all the descriptions about how wood does various different things? Oh, so. Mother of Tone. <laughs> That's good. Yes, one. Mother of Tone. Well, no, okay, so Altman Micro Machines is my favorite weird audio file site because on his list of inventions, he has the most bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> that seems useful. <laughs> I would like the most bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, is that really is it? That's as the British say, just taking the piss, or is it a serious? No. Is it actually serious? Yes. Oh wow, that's even better. Would you like to see? Would you like to see the Altman <laughs> Star Cycle, the world's most bicycle? Yes. <laughs> and so th this guy makes a little portable music player that I think is seven thousand dollars now. Oh, I remember this one. No, Sabaton, we're not talking about that. There's a, there's a particular website that's... Um, yeah, fun. The Altman Star Cycle, the world's most do you want bicycle. To put it, do you want to put it on on stream? Should I? Oh, it's up to you. Okay, hold on. I mean, this is always a risky thing. I don't know what Blaine's going to put what? on stream, so... What is that? It could, be, it could finally be unveiling his fursona. Okay. So Risky you can't see time. this, but I, if you in the actual like HTML for it, it literally says the world's most bicycle. Now I'm and looking at your, that, uh, your 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 bookmarks. Yep. Got a problem? No, I'm just I'm I'm seeing if there's anything I can judge you by, but I can't. Okay, well we've got Zeng Peel, Ohm's Law Calculator because I'm lazy as fuck. Web plot God digitizer. Last Zeng Peel. Spinorama. These, these are all reasonable. Oh, you got Equifax on there. Yeah. Oh, nice. Tried out my credit score. Yeah. Yeah. Experience too. I also have AI art. I never yeah. use this. Anyways, and something for playing Warhammer. Okay. So, where is the most bicycle? The world's most bicycle. <laughs> oh. I love Altman so much. So so and, go go through the audio stuff though, like the Okay, so the the sorry, right, the Terra player is the famous one, right? Oh my god, he's revised the site. <laughs> Woody. Woody. <laughs> Woody. <laughs> no, but like wasn't how wasn't there Ah, there was a reviewer who described a DAC as sounding wooden. I, I just love that. It's like, oh, this particular DAC filter makes it sound wooden. <laughs> like, I, I saw one it... where a guy was taking a Denifrips Ares 2 and tuning the sound by tightening the screw that held the lid on to make it so that when he tapped it, it would have a slightly <laughs> different note. Uh, I could not still... tell if that was satire or not, but I unfortunately don't think it was. So on Wood Mother of Tone, there's a bit where he just has wood yeah, this, sounds this one. good. This in... one, yes. <laughs> Blame your ears. No. So, no, this 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 one's an interesting one. Yeah, we're not we're not talking about the ZMF headphones with different woods. We're talking about a a specific thing. What here. material do you consist of? Bones <laughs> and flesh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's exceptional. Can we talk about the UEF acoustic dots? Because these are another. There it is. Scenario. That is the reason that wood sounds good. Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to share wood sounds good. <laughs> All right. How do I? There we go. Why would you want acoustic panels when you can have tiny acoustic dots for hundreds of dollars? Hmm. All right. Let's oh, do. Oh yeah, the stickers. Yes, this is from the same company that makes the purple fuse, of course. Let's do. Is two, there actually a purple fuse? There more... is an un, a worrying number of people buy it. Wait, what? Uh, I'll hang on. Let me send it to you. Uh, Meanwhile, is it like, an, is it like 
just a fuse fuse? It's literally just a fuse. That they, It's like $200 or something. $200? I'm going to link you the thread on... Is it on Head5? Oh, it's synergistic research, of course. Those guys also yeah. sold a cable that was full of sand. <sighs> Epic. Well, it makes it heavier. Well, it had like a, a box in it that they said was a filter, and it was just full of sand. <laughs> I remember seeing that Head5 thread. I think it was Big Shot who bought one and tore it open. It was funny. Fun. Good man. Let's get, let's get two more spicy takes... And we'll go to one thirty, and then put it there. He's a coward. He's I'm, weak. I'm hungry. <laughs> the right. detail is stored yeah. in the sand. <laughs> I mean, honestly, have we considered filling headphones with sand? Has anyone tried that yet? To, to inject more detail in it. Yeah, exactly. All right. This is it makes it sound grainier. Someone says I mean, synergistic one man's research. Another man's detail. What is synergistic research? I've not heard of this. Have you, you not? I haven't heard of the most famous. You've never heard of thing? synergistic research? No. This is the company that has never published any form of research, um, but sells very expensive uh, high end audio products of all. Oh, they've got pink fuses now. So they sell everything from cables to acoustic click on that link that i posted and put it on screen because it's hilarious oh the uef uh, acoustic dots uh, you can just explain just you could just share your thingy here That's okay okay easier. the purple quant quantum fuse why can't i zoom in beauty I'm... is in the eye of the fuse holder yes uh, and these are two hundred dollars. Jesus. And they a lot of I've seen so many people. On oh, this I have me. seen this. Yeah, Taryn sends me stuff from this all the time. <laughs> Note: If yeah. you are switching from an orange fuse to a purple fuse, start by inserting the purple fuse in the same direction as the orange fuse being replaced. If the f purple fuse is not an immediate improvement, flip the purple fuse in the alternate direction. Yeah, there's Terrence sent me some good stuff from this one. Um, what is Voodoo? They have a streaming <laughs> server called Voodoo. They have acoustic dots, which I think this is my favorite. They're little tiny little felt dots with some wire in them. I uh, also love the Ghost Eames chair. Yes, the Ghost Eames <laughs> chair isn't real. It can't hurt you. Um, <laughs> but like, how? What? How? They don't even explain what it wait, wait, wait. actually scroll does. Wait, wait, wait. Scroll down. Scroll down. I want to see the badges. What? The badges? No, scroll oh, up. Oh, yeah. No, no, scroll Name up. Shame. Uh, oh, there we are. Yeah. So who is... Uh, Absolute Sound, Hi-Fi Plus. I think they also sometimes have, like, uh, positive feedback. Satisfaction Freaking... guaranteed. Oh, okay. Listeners about asking the if he can join the, the thing just to hear us talk because his YouTube <laughs> isn't working. Oh, is it... That seems to be a black box that makes a big okay, wait, who, 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 let's, The badges of shame must be pause to feedback, stereo times, and audio bacon. And we we'll go up a bit and hi fi plus. Oh, and there's plus. more. Yep, audio bacon. Okay. I'm going to go to the Fuse, because that's the one which will have the most uh, accessories. Where the hell is so the I, I do have to ask, Jesus. though. Like Jesus Christ, why have they got... Ugh. And I do make this point, as hilarious as these things are. Like, at what point do we say, oh, well, clearly that's insane. You know, like... What do you a mean? while ago, I think. What? Enjoy the music. It's given it their great audio file gift for three years running. Enjoy the music are particularly positive positive feedback. That. Brutus Award. I, I, I it's. There uh, is a darkness to this industry. Every time I see this, I'm like, <laughs> why, why, why don't we just make some, uh, was it resonators, Vibratron? That's what they called it. The <laughs> So there's oh $4,000. Wow, what a deal. 
Vibratron is a handmade multi-frequency resonator which anchors the, anchors the focal point of your sound field to your listening room, expanding and clarifying your listening experience. It works by resonating in response to acoustic pressure created by your speakers. That is how resonance works. Um, I just... Hmm. I, the, oh, God, it's <laughs> not even... I don't like how it looks. I just, I, I don't have words. What is HFT? High frequency transducer. What? About the size of a shirt button, yet powerful enough to transform the way you experience music. What, what does it do? What do you do with them? Oh, you just, you just stick them on your spit. Okay. okay. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wow. I, oh, love, yeah, step I one. love the effort that's gone into one. this, though. Like, this is elaborate. This is the same visualization they've got the invisible eames chairs. It's just the same thing. What if I have uh, acoustic pucks and high frequency transducers? Do I put no, no? One it's on not the first? same because they're they're facing well, the other way. No, no, so no, no. Because this is the same spot, the so I can't use both. <laughs> also, if you have both of them at the same time, then the eames chairs constructively interfere and yeah. the real eames chair. <laughs> <laughs> no, you get intermodulation eames chair. Eames I'm, chair. I'm my absolute favorite. <laughs> is still this company telos audio with uh quantum stickers here we go you get a warranty card graphene obviously, sticker for your quantum graphene stickers can, and you, can should, you get a beryllium uh, sticker no no scratch that's and not sniff good enough. <laughs> <laughs> you should place these on capacitors and other components and it'll i i just wow this is $200, by the way, for a set of stickers. Well, this I is just, unhinged. I, I, I literally can't eat We it. have not talked about the cable, cable cooker. cooker yet. Wow. The cable cooker is a classic. What? Oh, God. Are yeah. you not aware of the cable cooker? Uh, no, I've seen that. There's a few different companies. Grounding boxes are the one that really grind my gears, though. Um, just because I'll... not only is it demonstrably ineffective, but it's worse than having an actual crown. I knew a guy who had a house that wasn't that had no ground, period. He could have used one of them. Or he could have done what I fucking told him to and run a wire out the window. Taryn just sent me like Oh, he's he sent me the cable cooker, like just basically a ton of links about like all this nonsense. And some of those were already on there. But the cable cooker one does Taryn know where the thing that telepathically beams the trouble to your brain is? I can't I find it. I know the one you mean, but I've not been able to find it. I can't find it either. There's, so quantum stickers, audio file SD cards, cable cooker, hi-fi fuses, linebacker SE copper passive power filter. Uh, what? <laughs> I don't know. All Oh, all the positive feedback reviews. Uh, hi. Albet system optimizer card. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Wait, are the brilliant pebbles gone off of my... Oh, no, good. There are still brilliant pebbles on Machina Dynamica. Good. If they ever go away, I feel like the entire world will end for me. Oh, okay. So this is... Wow, somebody reviewed... So this is basically just like an audio file. An... <laughs> yes, this is the one. Okay, I just have it on my phone here. I'm going to put it up to the... It's the Klangtuch. Klangtuch... Uh, the, yeah, AHP Klangtuch 4. And it's literally, it's the handkerchief. Oh, classic. yes, the classic. Yeah. But the, my favorite, so it's $68. And my favorite part about this is that not only, it, well, it's sold out, first of all. So people are buying it. And there are 14 reviews. <laughs> but my favorite part about this is that this is the Klangtuch 4. So there, <laughs> there have been revisions and they've presumably improved things. <laughs> I I mean every time I see this kind of oh that people are actually buying and you know yeah. some of these have big stands at Munich and stuff so clearly they've got the budget like ha why don't why don't we just give up and just start selling cables I mean oh Jesus Jesus Jesus, Jesus, Jesus Christ no That's but why like we sell cables no that yeah, was we my sell meme cables about the like, listen what, cables. 50, how much are the listen more cables hundred bucks. Yeah. Not 
and they're specifically and, and they're specifically and... marketed as not making not making any uh, acoustic differences that yeah. we know of. <laughs> that we know. Of. We didn't. We didn't test that. Yeah, it does make broken headphones work. We did find that to be the case. That is true. It does revive the dead. But yeah. other than that, we have no <laughs> fantastical claims. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, that was just because Hi-Fi Man 3.5 millimeter jacks suck. Yep. Yep. Oh dear. Well, that was good fun. I think yeah. we've got through a fair bit of snake oil. And if anyone's got any further questions they want to ask any or any of us three, then uh, join the headphones.com Discord, discord.gg slash headphones or the headphones.com forum. And also by desk. What? Yeah, I think I got a shipping notification <laughs> that it uh, has been sent out to me. So. Oh wait, is desk actually for sale? I thought that was just a meme. I think a listener might have got one too. What the hell? Am I actually doing marketing? I thought I was just trolling people. I mean, I've been had. No, like the new the new desk. I think is something that people are uh, potentially getting. I actually don't know because I do, I have no notification that that's what it is, but. There's a shipping notification, and we're hopeful that it's Dusk. The Moondrop Dusk 2 Blessing? There's a ladybug that's on my softbox right now, and it is slowly crawling to the center of it, but that's where it's, like, the hottest, so it's probably going to get fried. That's kind of messed up. Yeah. Okay, on that terrible disappointment, it's time to end. (laughs) Hammond, you blithering idiot! Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> if that's not copywritten, it should be because I want to use it all the time. But yeah, uh, as usual, thanks to the uh, the co-hosts here and uh, for the spirited discussion. Thanks to all of you guys in the chat. And uh, yeah, as usual, uh, I'll check all the links in the description and stuff. We'll see you in the next one. See you next one. Bye.